<laughs> Welcome to Let's Get It The Atheist Roundtable. That was terrible. Let's do that again. Huh? That's the mic, what you doing? What up with Eddie? Why he sweaty on your noodle? I don't get it. He lost his shit. The whole kid caboodle. Now pause. You pause. Everybody tell him that he's a lost cause. Who's the ass in the hat? Half Christian ass. Always talking this and talking that. And Benji, Benji on the epistemology. You got claims, got beliefs. What's your confidence? And is it relevant? Nah. Just Jeff. What's next? What text you gonna put to the test? Put to the test. Little troll face weasel on TikTok looking like a beetle juice. And what do you do when a member of your crew sits in a shed with the dead? I don't know what's up. Anybody seen me jump? Uh, now the newest member of the crew. The top debut, here's your preview. It's K Nevs. She says she's the live stream queen. Welcome to the team. Uh, yeah, yeah. Welcome to the team. The atheist round table. Is faith a reliable pathway to truth? Hey, yo, Oz, are we going on a deep dive? Jesus in the morning. Jesus in the morning. Welcome to the Atheist Jesus Roundtable. In the evening. <laughs> it's Tart Live Debate Night. I am when, Oz. And when Jesus is on a bagel, you can eat Jesus anytime. Huh? You know, pizza in the morning, pizza in the... Whatever. Okay. That was cool. Jeff, how are you? <laughs> Doing well. Good, good. Uh, I'm excited. We've had this on the books here, I think, about three weeks now, and I'm excited, looking forward to it. And I know the, uh, the guys have been uh, getting prepped and uh, ready to go. But before we uh, jump into action, I want to let everybody know uh, two shows uh, coming up here. We have um, uh, Dave Warnock coming on the 17th. Put that in your calendar. You want to be here for that. And then on the 23rd, Saturday, we have a six- uh, member panel discussion on who was Jesus um, historically. Uh, that one's going to be. Uh, we have some. There's some great people lined up for uh, for that one. But uh, Jeff, anything uh, you have going on, or anything you want to talk about before we bring the competitors on? I I will tease. I am working on some some in depth videos uh, that will be premiering on the Tart Channel sometime soon, probably within the next few weeks. And then of course we have started our book club in the Discord. Um, that has started this week. So on the sixth, we're going over chapter one of uh, Doctor Josh's book. And I actually don't have it by me. Of uh, oh, oh, I got it. Never mind. Here it is. Fifth Old Testament door slavery. Yeah. So we're reading chapter one, and we're going to be uh, talking with that as a group on the sixth in Discord. So if you got the book, you can still join. Um, or get the digital copy, whatever. It's it's on Kindle. And I just talked to uh, Josh. It was about I think it was about five o'clock. Him and I him and I spoke, and he was giving me uh, some uh, inside information on this new book that's coming out. And oh. I'll just say it'll be another one that I, I think uh, another here, topic we can move on to. Here, here the 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 Tart team will be another one of those where we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cool. Well, uh, without further ado, uh, let's uh, let's bring the the competitors to the screen. Zach Randolph, how are you? Great. How are you? Great. Thanks for having me. This is a great way to start the new year for twenty twenty one. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm in. Uh, when Randolph comes in, uh, comes on, I, I feel a little more Canadian uh, each each time he <laughs> each time he comes on. So uh, we appreciate you guys being here. Before we get into uh, uh, the format and topic and all that, 
uh, I want to make sure you guys can introduce yourselves and shill away, plug away anything you have going on, and then uh, we'll get down to business. So, Zach, we'll start with you. Tell us about uh, yourself and where everybody can find you. Yeah, um, thanks for having me on the show. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Raina, for um, choosing to debate against me. It should be a lot of fun. Uh, so my name is Zach. I have a YouTube channel called like, Here in Apologetics. Uh, basically, what we do, it's an apologetics channel. We're looking at Christian questions relating to philosophy or biblical studies, um, the Old Testament, New Testament, everything. It's so much fun. Um, so if you want to hop on that, we have a podcast and a YouTube channel where you can listen to conversations with scholars who are a lot smarter than me. And we talk about these really important issues and hopefully all seek truth together as we try to figure out the nature of reality. So thank you for having me. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks. For, thanks for being here. And uh, Randolph, tell us all about you. <laughs> well, I am the founder of the organization here in Canada called Canadian Atheists. Uh, we're working to uh, normalize atheism in society and to counter vilification efforts. That's a, a part of that. We're hoping that uh, uh, normalizing in society, uh, not believing in deities, is going to catch on around the world. Uh, we want it to be accepted the same as uh, someone who proclaims belief in a deity so that we're not being ostracized anymore. And, and we are seeing improvement in that here in Canada and in some other countries, and, and we hope it's going to spread. Um, people can reach me at canadianatheists.ca or read more about our organization there. And uh, you can also find me on YouTube at www.youtube.com slash Randolph Richardson. Remember, my name is spelled with an F, not PH. Thank you very much for uh, having uh, Zach and I on here to uh, to go over this topic. Absolutely. Nope. Uh, like I said, looking forward to it. And uh, it's uh, showtime. But uh, so I'll go through the format uh, so everybody's aware that's uh, that's watching and listening tonight and uh, can can play along. So hopefully everybody brought their popcorn and their favorite drink and uh, ready to uh, to do it to it. So the the format will be 10 minute, uh, 10 minute openings. Uh, then 10 minute uh, rebuttals, then we'll have a 30 minute uh, open uh, conversation or dialogue, uh, and then a 10 minute uh, close, and then we'll go to Q&A with, uh, with, uh, uh, with the viewers. Uh, the topic for the evening is everybody's favorite topic. Does God exist? Does it so, get more basic than that? <laughs> uh, so I'm going to uh, take uh, the two ugly faces off screen. Um, and I mean, oh, no, Jeff no, and I- I need to be here. I need to be here. Uh, I I meant Jeff and I. Je Jeff and oh. I. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna take uh, take our faces off the screen, and uh, you guys will be up. And then uh, uh, Zach, like I said, as soon as you start to speak, uh, I'll have the uh, the clock ready to go, and uh, we'll get the, we'll get the party started here. Right. Um, thank you once again um, for hosting and for Randolph. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm sure everyone has before God debates, uh, all kinds of different versions and models of God. So exciting. But today we're just starting with uh, Does God Exist? I encourage everyone as you uh, enter this debate, start as neutral as you can and kind of like explore the different hypotheses we're going to discuss here. So, just to start off, I think it's helpful to talk about like just what do I mean by God? Uh, so, from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, they say that conceptions of maximal greatness differ, but these believe that a maximally great reality must be a maximally great person or God. These largely agree that a maximally great person would be omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, and all good. Uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, a great place to start, and that's why I use this quote um, to understand what, I, what do I mean by God. And for this debate, I'm just arguing for a necessary, maximally great mind. Um, so what I'm going to present is three arguments for the existence of God. The first being the necessary being explained why there's something rather than nothing. Uh, the second, the fine tune of the universe points to a designer. And third, events that occur if metaphysical naturalism, um, also known as atheism, were true, occur, then therefore metaphysical naturalism, also known as atheism, is false. I understand there, there might be a lot of people listening that, that would say that atheism is just an absence of belief, including, I believe, Randolph, and I respect that. And if he wants to call himself um, an atheist, I'm totally, that's totally fine. I'm more interested in what he believes rather than um, the word and the terminology. But just for the sake of the debate, I'm going to be using in my opening statement, atheism is the belief that there is no God. And I understand that there are many atheists who would disagree with that. Um, first, 
The first argument I'm bringing forth is that there is a necessary being, also known as God. This argument that I'm using is developed by Alexander Proust. It's called. It's from also from Leibniz. It's an argument from contingency. Premise one says that every contingent fact has an explanation. This is backed by the principle of sufficient reason. There's many different kinds, but what it says is that if contingent facts happen, there's explanations. Uh, a contingent fact would be something that could happen or not. It's just something that's possible. Say, my existence is contingent. I didn't have to exist, but I do exist. The premise two says there's a contingent fact that contains all other contingent facts. I think this premise can be backed by the idea of just imagine a big blob of everything. And in this big blob of everything, there is every fact, um, every contingent fact. So we can just kind of imagine this fact that contains all contingencies that exist in our world. Um, and therefore, there'd be an explanation of this fact. Like I said before, contingent facts depend on other facts for explanations. So I think that this big blob of contingency would have some sort of explanation. This kind of goes to the heart of like the question of why is there something rather than nothing? This argument would argue that this explanation must involve a necessary being. Um, what I mean here is not necessarily when we hear the word being, you may think I'm necessarily referring to a mind for this argument. That's not the case. Many skeptics can and do stop at premise four and would agree that there is a necessary being, but their necessary being may be something like energy or maybe like a quantum vacuum or say, argue that there's this infinite regress and it's necessary. I think that's fine. You can agree with premise four and say there's a necessary being. Um, where I get to God here is the, the fifth premise, which says that this necessary being is God. So the question is, how do we get to a necessary being? When we ask the question, why is there something rather than nothing? Why well, think it's God rather than like maybe the universe or energy or quantum fluctuations or all these other seeming options we have? And one argument that I'll briefly present here, but if we want to explore more as we further progress in this debate, is the argument from limits. Josh Matt Rasmussen developed this in his book, How Reason Can Lead to God. And what he writes is that all limits alike have an outside explanation upon which they depend. Yet the basic features of the foundation, by contrast, lack an, lack an outside explanation. There are no contingencies in the necessary foundation of reality. Therefore, the basic features of the foundations have no limits. This is expressed in the problem of, the, of arbitrary limits. Let's say that there are 100 units of energy that exist as the foundation of reality. And from that springs all, everything that's come into existence. I think this argument gets at the heart of, let's say, well, why couldn't there be 101 or 99 or 98 or 102? It seems that all limits that we encounter are the product of other things. There's 100 milliliters of water in this water bottle. It's because I poured that amount and maybe drank some. So that's why there's that limit. So I think that with the foundation of reality, there is no limits. A limitless foundation would be omnipotent since there is no limit on it, omniscient because there is no limit and personal since it would be the foundation of all being and bring everything into existence. And as we go into this debate, if Renoff wants to talk about any of that, I'm looking forward to it. But argument number two is that design points to a designer. I'm just going to use William Lane Craig's argument from fine tuning in here. There's a bunch of different kinds. I also love Robin Collins, but for the sake of debate, this is probably the most simple. Um, the fine tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. It's not due to physical necessity or chance. Therefore, it's due to design. So let's talk about this argument very briefly. First, the question is, why I think there is fine tuning in the first place? Um, these are just a couple examples taken from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy of Fine Tuning. This um, encyclopedia doesn't either atheist or atheist standards written by atheists and atheists talking about all the different issues in philosophy, a great resource. And a couple examples of fine tuning. I think in philosophy, it's not really contested that there's fine tuning. The question would be, um, what does that mean, if anything? Um, so a couple examples is if the gravitational force had been absent or substantially weaker, galaxies and stars and planets would not have formed in the first place. Another example relating not to the constants, but the early conditions of the universe is low entropy. According to Alexander Proust, who's one of the most brilliant theists today, this is actually his favorite example of fine tuning. And it's really interesting to try to wrap your mind around it. But he said that the initial entropy of the universe must have been exceedingly low. According to Roger Penrose, who is, I believe, an atheist, he might be an agnostic, um, the, the low entropy resembling the one in which we live populate only one part in 10 to the 123rd of the available phase space volume. So a couple of examples of fine tuning. I believe you talked to Luke Barnes, who's an astronomer. I think you have about 30 or 40 examples of fine tuning. So why I think the argument holds, supporting premise one, I'm just going with the, ex the explanations given that we have during, sorry, my apologies, the pot only potential explanations we have given the current data. Um, if there's others, well, maybe there are, but we have to work on the evidence we have, not just um, theoretical conceivabilities. Um, premise two, 
it says there's no reason to believe that there is that physical necessity explains the fine tuning. I think a good reason to explain this is the principle of indifference. Um, this is kind of developed in Bayesian uh, theory, and it basically says that um, the principle of indifference states that in the absence of any relevant evidence, agents should distribute their credence or degrees of belief equally among all possible outcomes under consideration. It seems very easily conceivable that the constants could have been different. So in the absence of any other relevant evidence, we should accept that they definitely could have been. Um, the idea of chance is extremely improbable. I'm sure if you listen to God debate, you've heard someone say that there's a one in 10 zillion chance that this would happen by chance in terms of fine tuning. And I would hold to that as well. Um, not an exact number, just kind of reference in here. Um, third, we're talking about miracles, an argument from miracles. So premise one says, if miracles happen, God exists. Premise two, miracles happen. So premise three are the conclusion, God exists. And I'm defining a miracle as an event that would not occur if metaphysical naturalism is true. Why I think that miracles happen? So there's a couple different studies here, and I'll just hit on this very briefly because I only have about a couple minutes left. But one study done in 18, between 1982 and 1983 was a double-blind survey. Um, intercessors were chosen um, based on being born-again Christians. And as a result, hopefully you can read this slide, uh, fewer patients in the prayer group required ventilatory support, antibiotics, or diatrics. The study said that... Um, Patients that were entered into the prayer group had less congestive heart failure, less diuretic and antibiotic therapy, and had fewer episodes of pneumonia, pneumonia ugh, and fewer cardiac arrests and were less frequently incubated and, and ventil ventilated. My apologies. Uh, another um, study, similar thing done in 2001, shows a similar result. And at that time, it had been mission patients were randomized to receive prayer or not um, compared with the prayer group, the usual care group with the prayer group. The prayer group had a lower mean um, of scores, they were ended up being healthier. Uh, remote and intercessory prayer was associated with lower um, course scores, which was good. It meant they were healthier coming out of care. This result suggests that prayer may be an effective adjunct to standard medical care. So all I'm trying to do with that argument is just say that what's these um, seem, seemingly correlations between the success of prayer and uh, statistical studies and just, um, my apologies, um, and just science with how this works, what's more likely? Under theism, you totally expect that the prayer group would have better health. Under atheism, the belief that there is no God, I understand if that's not what you hold, but I'm just using that for the course of this opening statement. Um, you wouldn't expect there to be any difference because there would be no God, but there is a difference, which seems to me to make it the existence of God more po probable. So to conclude, where are we now? I know I've just thrown a lot of information at you and I apologize, but we, I've brought three positive arguments for God's existence coming from there being a necessary being, fine tuning and miracles. Randolph does not have a burden of proof to show that God does not exist, but I did bring three arguments leading to the conclusion that God exists. So Randolph has um, a burden to show why these positive reasons fail. That's because if these arguments hold, God exists. So Randolph has to show why these reasons fail. Um, he doesn't have to prove that God doesn't exist. He just has to show why my reasons for leading to the existence of God fail. Because if these arguments fail, we're bet left at best at being an agnostic unless Randolph provides positive arguments for atheism. Once again here, I'm referring to atheism by its traditional definition of belief that there is no gods. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time, for this opening statement. Really pumped to see what Randolph has. So thank you. <laughs> That was an interesting interlude. <laughs> First thing I'm going to start with is a quick objection here. Um, that is not the traditional definition of atheism. That is an anti-theistic point of view. Uh, the traditional, if you want to get traditional, we need to look at the etymology, which does not support that. So it is just an absence of belief in deities. But I'm not going to go into great depth on that. Um, and that's fine. I do appreciate that you're uh, recognizing where the burden, uh, the onus of justification or burden of proof lies. Uh, I think that's fair and honest of you. And I thank you for that. That uh, makes things a lot easier for both of us. <laughs> so um, I do, um, uh, I don't really have much of an opening statement uh, prepared. I don't normally prepare them for these things, The um, uh, but I will talk about a couple of things. Um, I will try to kind of address your points and that'll, that'll serve as my opening statement, I think. Uh, you talked about a number of different points um, and I did make some notes. So um, I'll, uh, I think I'll, I'll start with um, uh, kind of an overall thing. Um, everything that you're talking about seems to uh, 
point to an idea of a singular god, not multiple gods and goddesses working together as teams to make things work. And one thing I'll be very interested to know is, from your point of view, how you um, how you justify favoring the idea of a single deity over multiple deities for life, the universe, and everything, so to speak. Because I, I think that'll be an important thing to cover. I'll just quickly go through some of the other things, and then we can, I guess, go back and forth. Um, there is um, the necessary being to explain something rather than nothing. And I, I think what we should probably do is get into what you think the characteristics of absolutely nothing are, if you think there are any such characteristics. Um, I take the position that um, for absolutely nothing to be absolutely nothing, uh, there would not, that would not necessitate anything in particular, including laws of physics, laws of logic, and different things like that. And so it would not be, um, perhaps it would not be impossible for the whole entire cosmos to erupt from absolutely nothing, um, since um, that would also mean that there may not be any constraints. The, the, the big challenge we have with absolutely nothing is that, uh, as far as I'm aware, scientists have not had absolutely nothing to experiment with and to poke and prod at and to figure out. Um, and there are people who would argue that that's the same for deity. Uh, nobody's been able to actually been, have a deity to interact with and test these things out. So uh, that I think will lead to some interesting conversation. Um, there's uh, a necessity to to explain something rather than nothing. So so there we go. Um, the fine tuning argument I don't see any credibility in that one because when I take a look at how much of the universe is not hospitable to life and a number you threw out there was 10 to the power of 123 of the available phase space volume. Um, yeah, it, we're, we're tiny as far as the size of the entire cosmos, let alone the size of our universe goes that we are aware of so far. We really don't know how big it actually is. Um, there are some people making guesses, but if we just consider the size that we've been able to detect so far, um, we're, we wouldn't even compare it as a, as a grain of sand on the beach by my estimation. And so if this was a fine-tuned universe, then why is the vast majority of it not hospitable to life? I think that's a big problem for the fine-tuning argument. Events wouldn't occur without God is another claim that's made. And um, this, I think, is a presumption that uh, there's a deity that controls everything. And I am I would like to see some evidence of that. I'm, I'm stuck with not seeing kind of any evidence for that. Um, I do have criteria for what would prove to me that a deity is real, that such a deity is real, but I'm not, uh, I'm not there. Um, you, you pointed out that all limits have an outside explanation. Um, I would be very interested if you could elaborate a little more on that. Um, it would be uh, maybe with an example of, of some limits, like I guess uh, if, you'd con if you're considering the laws of logic to be uh, one such limit or the laws of physics to be another such limit. So if, if you wanted to kind of explain why this doesn't just occur naturally and that uh, uh, this is something that is somehow prescribed and proscribed in, in tandem there by some outside uh, explanation, I'd be very interested in that. Now I'm assuming by outside explanation you mean outside of the cosmos. Um, correct me if I'm wrong on that. but. <laughs> um, uh, a limitless foundation would be omnipotent, omniscient, and personal. I find this interesting, and I would like to explore this more with you. And uh, uh, design points to a designer from William Lane Craig. Now, William Lane Craig is well respected in uh, theistic circles, in particular as a uh, as a philosopher, and he has studied philosophy. He knows it well, and he does make many great arguments. He's also a big proponent of the Kalam cosmological argument, which I reject right from the first premise. Um, because I, I find that it, it's lacking. Um, you, you pointed out physical necessity or chance um, is what the universe is due to, and it, and then the next part of it says, oh, it is not due to physical necessity or chance, so therefore it is due to design. Um, I, I think that argument is missing some things. I, I think that uh, it needs, more information is needed before that conclusion can actually be supported, because it looks like that's just an assumption. 
Um, the final one that you pointed out, miracles happen. If miracles happen, God exists. And to me, um, that seems to indicate that you're referring to miracles that are caused by God. And since the, mir the nature of miracles, as they're commonly defined, are dependent on a deity, um, such as the Christian God, um, I, I think I can accept that because it is conditional and hypothetical. So the next premise, number two, miracles happen. Um, where's the evidence? <laughs> so miracles happen needs explanation, needs validation. So that's where we're at. Um, I hope this can serve okay as my opening statement. One last point I will make here is a question from it. Um, if people were made in God's image, and if God is perfect, then why are people imperfect? Thank you very much. All right, Jeffy Jeff. Just so you know, you're muted. I got your back, dog. I got your back. So round one, round one. How you feeling? I, I think it was really good. I think this is probably one of the best openings that we've had. Um, we got PowerPoints going on. I mean, we got very well thought out statements. Um, you know, I can't say I agree with everything, but uh, it's a very good start. I, I look forward to see where this progresses, um, especially some of the claims that were made. And I think Randolph makes a good point. Uh, about the miracles thing. And and I know, I, I, I think a lot of times it's easy to to throw in, like if something happens that's unexplained to just throw it in as a miracle. But I know specifically with the medical stuff, and I'm sure Randolph might get into that too. Um, some studies have been out there that if they don't know, if you don't know you're being prayed for, a lot of times you don't get those same effects. So, you know, I, I, I would like to see some real evidence of miracles, uh, you know, whatever whatever he's got. Yeah, and uh, a completely uh, shameless plug, uh, but on the on the ozone uh, show today, we talked about this the the prayer, uh, some of the, the the placebo effect. Yeah, you know, and um, you know the the lack of evidence that prayer prayer works in a supernatural sense. Sure. You know, um, so uh, we we do need to have evidence to uh, to back that up. But uh, I th it's I think interesting too because, like, I know you've come from faith to no faith, just like I've come from faith to no faith. And there, for me, I don't know about you, but one of the things that I missed the most was um, prayer in the way that it worked. And I had to find a substitution for that. And my substitution was meditation. And I now get better effects of that, whatever mental alchemy is going on there uh, from meditation and, and mindfulness and, and being able to control my mind. So I think that prayer does have positive effects on the individual. I just don't think that it's coming from an outside source. It's something you're doing internally. Correct. Which is, uh, and kudos, kudos to Zach that there, we, um, um, it's not very often we get to have somebody that comes prepared, you know, with uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, a, a PowerPoint and notes and, and, and all that. And I, and I'd say that with all respect, I mean, I genuinely mean that, that it means a lot to me that, uh, that he, one respects his own argument, but even yeah. uh, respects our platform enough to come, <laughs> you know, prepared well prepared. And ready, ready to go. Absolutely. So we, we appreciate that, Zach. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think it's time to get, uh, to get back to it. So the next, uh, the next part of the argument will be uh, the 10 minute rebuttals. So uh, we will treat it the same way we did. Uh, we'll bring them back on uh, screen. And as soon as Zach starts to speak, I will hit the, uh, I'll hit the stopwatch. So round two, let's get it. Zach, you're muted. All righty. Thank you. Um, so I'll get started now. This probably won't take minute, 10 minutes, but I'll hopefully get through everything that Randolph talked about his opening statement and a little bit of what you guys showed in that kind of cool little like interlude thing. Never seen that. Yeah, that was interesting. Um, Never had that right. interlude before. <laughs> All right. I will start now with my first rebuttal. And if you want to start the timer, that works. Um, so let's just start with this. Um, I don't really want to talk about the definition of atheism for a while. I would say I would disagree with Randolph that it's on my opinion, it's not the traditional definition. It was really only until Antony Flew in the 1970s that atheism was defined as an absence of belief. Um, but I don't, it's not really relevant for me to debate it at this point. It's just kind of like, whatever. Um, yeah, it's off topic. Oh, it was all respect to and if, and it's my opening, my rebuttal, so I'd please respect um, just my, my time here. All right, so let's get into a little bit of what he says. Um, first, I want to cover his objections um, to my arguments, and then we'll talk about 
the um, just kind of like more general things. First, he talks about the idea that, that we just don't know the characteristics of an absolute nothing. Um, and we just can't experiment on it. And from that, we really just can't know. Maybe the universe could come from nothing. I don't know if that's what he's inferring, but I'm sure he can clarify. But I would talk about what I mean by nothing. Um, it's kind of irrelevant to this debate because I'm not arguing that the universe began to exist. I think we could have an infinite regress and we could run my um, argument that I'm bringing from Alexander Proust here. So I think it's kind of irrelevant to this debate. But in terms of nothing, um, I can talk about a metaphysical nothing, literally nothing. Um, something, Nothing is the absence of everything. Um, you can say maybe abstract objects technically exist. That's fine. Um, if the universe came from nothing, it would still be a contingent thing. Um, we, we still have a necessary being. That's the heart of the argument, um, the cosmological argument, is we're talking about, like, what is this necessary being? If your necessary being is nothing, okay, that's fine if that's what you believe, but let's just let's talk about this necessary being. Um, the next thing I talk about um, is the argument from limits. How do we get from necessary being to God? Uh, he says... What limits am I talking about? That's a great qual um, clarifying question. I really appreciate that, Randolph, because I think it really helps understand the heart of this argument. So the, the argument um, against arbitrary limits for the foundation is talking about exactly arbitrary limits. Um, I believe it's Josh Rasmussen that's developed an argument from limits. And when we're talking about an arbitrary limit, we're talking about something with a number of atoms or particles or super strings, um, something that you could almost like quantitatively count. Um, we're not talking about like the laws of logic. I would say that um, everything obeys the laws of logic and that's not any arbitrary limit because there's no like set quantity to the laws of logic. Like they're not like a hundred units or whatever. When I'm talking about the foundation, it's specifically arguing against maybe like, let's say as energy is the necessary foundation. I brought this up earlier. Um, and let's just say there's a hundred units of energy that have just always existed. Well, why have they? It seems like an arbitrary limit. So I hope that kind of clarifies from talking out from there. Uh, I think that was it for the first argument. So I didn't see a specific premise he was disagreeing with, um, but we can talk about that more as we keep on going. With fine tuning, um, he brings up the idea that the universe is not hospitable to life. Um, so, and he brings this as an objection to fine tuning. So there's a lot that could be said here, um, but, the, but the examples I brought up from fine tuning were specific for a certain reason. Um, they're not talking about whether um, life can occur in planets. We're talking about whether there'd be planets or galaxies or anything in the first place. I brought up the gravitational con um, constant. And what I talked about is that if gravity had been absent or weaker, galaxies and stars and planets would have not formed in the first place. If they're stronger, a very similar thing would happen. Um, so with this argument, with this constant, it's not about a specific form of life or anything like that. And with low entropy, um, it's a really weird thing to get your mind around. Um, so I understand, but I think Randolph misunderstands um, the low entropy. It's talking about in the early universe, we're talking about right after the Big Bang, and it's talking about um, the initial entropy of the universe being very low. Um, if the entropy was different, if it was a little bit, if it populated a, like a larger volume, um, we have a universe that just expands and nothing forms. Um, so I hope that kind of helps clarify that. Um, he says the fine-tuning argument is missing something. I'm not exactly sure what that was. Um, I might be missing something actually out of his um, opening statement there because I wrote it down and then I don't know what he's referring to when he's saying he's missing something. Um, oh, I think he's talking about William Lane Craig um, and the argument and it's just like only these three options. Okay, well, that's, that's fine, but I'm just going off of what we have um, in terms of like the data and what people have said. If you run enough forms to bring another hypothesis to explain fine tuning, that's fine. We can talk about that. Um, the argument for miracles, there was lots of fun stuff here. Um, he says, where's the evidence needs validation? I would say that these studies that I brought up were peer reviewed in medical journals. These aren't just things that were popped up off the streets and both of them brought up forth results where the group that was prayed for had better health results than the group that was not prayed for. Um, in one study done in 2001, it was 67% in good health, 19% in bad health compared to 64 and 21. And the study done in 1988, it said that 163 people were in good health after the study and 27 in bad health. Um, if they were prayed for in, in terms of the control group, the group not prayed for, um, 147 were prayed for and 44 were not prayed for. I also noticed um, in your guys' awesome little like middle thing, uh, I think it was Jeff brought up the point, um, not necessarily responding to Randolph here, but Jeff brought up this objection, which is really good. And it's good to clarify, these are double blind studies. These people who were prayed for, um, they didn't know whether they're being prayed for or not. Um, so I do think that gets around Jeff's objection there in both of these studies, because these are double blind studies. A very simple definition is a double blind study is one which neither the participants nor the experimenters know who's re receiving a particular treatment. So I appreciate Jeff's um, 
kind of like response there. And I hope that clarifies that because it's a really insightful point that Jeff brings up. And I think that I hope they clarified it, that these were double blind studies. Um, let's see what else do we got here. Um, where's the evidence? I brought up the evidence. Now some of his general objections. Um, why just one God? Um, this is a really good question that I, I stand to bring up before. A uh, couple of reasons to think that it's just one necessary foundation. First, Occam's razor. Why multi don't multiply causes beyond necessities? Why posit there's two limited beings when one perfect being will do? It seems like a simpler and better explanation than um, just having these limited beings that just exist. Um, bringing forth the argument from limits and just Occam's razor here. Also, uh, my friend Kyle Lander, who on the Christian Idealism YouTube channel, I ran this idea past him in preparation for this debate. And we talked about, I argue God being um, absolute perfection. Um, and what that means is being perfect means having power over everything else. But a perfect being can't have power over a perfect being. So neither one is maximally perfect. If we have multiple gods, what we have is max is two limited beings, which would go against the argument from limits, which I think bridges us from the necessary foundation to God. Um, if God is perfect, why aren't we perfect? That's a great question. I would say this isn't relevant to this debate. Uh, I do have a little bit of time left, though, so I'll be sure to just talk about. I think that one day as Christians, we have this belief that we are going to become perfect. This life is kind of like gives us the ability to understand uh, what, what's going on here. It, God gives us free will to kind of choose to believe in him because it seems like being forced to believe in him wouldn't have the same value as choosing to believe in him. I would say, though, I'd kind of like to explore the arguments in the rest of this time just because this isn't really relevant to this debate. It's just kind of like an interesting question. So I appreciate your question. And I think that's it. So I appreciate everything. Um, as far as I know, um, should be a lot of fun. And yeah, I'll see the last couple minutes of my time. And I look forward to Randolph's rebuttal. So thank you. Thank you, Zach. I guess Tart's asleep at the switch at the moment. So we'll just uh, move on into <laughs> to my responses here. Oh, there no, he is. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'd put it in a private chat. You, uh, As soon as he was done, uh, I'm stopping the clock. And uh, Randolph, as soon as you start, I'm hitting the clock. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was uh, making a few notes here while uh, without watching right. the chat. So, I, nope, I completely understand. Go no you, it's, it's all you. Okay, no thank you very much, Zach. Um, the uh, um, the idea that uh, nothing is the absence of everything is, I think, correct, and uh, and that's why uh, everything would include things like laws of logic, laws of physics, and and other kind of natural things that we we notice, um, and so when you're saying that something can't come from nothing, uh, that seems to me to be a rule that would therefore render absolutely nothing, not absolutely nothing anymore. And I, I'm curious how or why does this justify a being being in existence, um, such as your God? So um, let's see, fine tuning. You mentioned you're referring to one big bang. And my understanding is that uh, Stephen Hawking and uh, Penrose had both um, uh, worked together to update the, uh, the scientific theory of the Big Bang to include multiple Big Bangs and, uh, because of quantum physics. And so, uh, and I'm not talking about multiverse theory, which comes up an awful lot in response to this, but rather multiple Big Bangs uh, creating our current universe. And imagine with a single Big Bang, perhaps our universe would be uh, the shape of an oblate spheroid or, or a perfect sphere as a result of that. That would seem to make sense with the laws of physics, laws of logic and whatnot. Just, just seems, to, seems, to, uh, seems to fit. But if there's multiple Big Bangs, perhaps our universe would be more like the shape of a lumpy potato. <laughs> um, so the idea is interesting. And if people are saying, well, there can only be one first, I, I have to cast a shadow of doubt on that as well, because um, I can't think of anything that would possibly rule out uh, the possibility of two or more of these big bangs occurring simultaneously at the very beginning and throughout. There could be multiple happening in tandem later on. They may not even be related and could still happen at the same time. I'm not aware of something that could make that an impossibility. So um, uh, that's something I think uh, makes it worthy of consideration to say, okay, maybe there are multiple bangs. Um, there's... Um, uh, the idea of uh, the fine-tuning, I, I do think that you're possibly 
shifting a little bit because the fine tuning argument, as I've been aware of it all this time, has been to justify why there's life in the universe. And uh, you seem to be addressing it in a different way uh, as in why there's a universe. So um, that that's an interesting new kind of uh, perspective on this. Um, and so I, I'm wondering if maybe there's a different name for this argument, perhaps, or uh, because, or, or if there's uh, something that I've missed in the past on this. Um, so you're talking about um, uh, going off known options, uh, basing on known options uh, from William Lane Craig's arguments. Why is that a suitable limit? Um, just because we are aware of certain options is actually, in my view, a human limitation. What we know is what we've been able to find out so far with our own scientific endeavors and whatnot, and uh, philosophical questioning and, and, and on and on it goes. That, just because we've thought of a lot of things, doesn't necessarily mean we've thought of everything. There could be a lot of other possibilities that we have not considered yet and are yet to be discovered. So I, I don't want to uh, take the risk of limiting um, my options uh, to only what's known um, unless there's some way that I can absolutely rule out other explanations. And, and I think that's part of where William Lane Craig's argument falls apart. Intercessory prayer studies, as I understand it, um, the early ones have been debunked and there was a much larger one done with uh, much greater statistical significance. It's on PubMed. Um, the, I'll just put the link into the private chat so that people can uh, look at that in the, uh, hopefully the moderators can include that into the public uh, live chat. Um, it's a PubMed article that uh, talks about intercessory prayer um, and they're finding it to be pretty neutral as, as I understand it. Um, they're seeing numbers about 51, 50% in there and uh, they were finding that there wasn't really too much change. But one interesting thing, as I recall, and it's been a while since I've read it, but one interesting thing I recall from it was that people who thought there were people praying for them, um, uh, there was a slightly higher number of problems that continued and complications that arose out of it. Um, but um, they're thinking that that kind of, I believe they're thinking that matches a um, margin of error. So it's still in the end looks neutral once you discount that. Um, but the double blind point is very good. That's a very important one. Um, why just one God? Occam's razor um, is definitely an important tool for this. Um, uh, if one being has to handle everything, that doesn't necessarily mean things are simpler. That means that that one being has to know more, has to have a more complex set of thought processes and uh, a greater degree of understanding of things. So a greater education and whatnot. So it's, um, uh, I'm not so sure that Occam's razor um, uh, actually uh, gives you the answer there to, it actually favors you there. With multiple deities, you could, I guess in theory, have some deities who specialize in planet construction and another deities who specialize in star construction and uh, different things like that. And another uh, group of deities that decides where the different galaxies go so that there are fewer collisions. And um, so hopefully there, there aren't any. Now we're seeing, it looks like there are going to be some collisions between galaxies, which are very likely going to be very bad for any life on any solar systems within these galaxies. So, this to me does not look like a perfect design. Um, you mentioned that being perfect means having power over everything else. Um, and uh, you, you made the argument that multiple gods can't do that. That sounds to me like a presumption that multiple deities would not be able to get along. It's as if there's a presumption of some competitive nature there. Um, I, I don't see why a team of deities who all know the same things, who are all say omniscient, wouldn't be able to work together. So I, I find that argument precarious. Uh, and my final question to you is, why is perfection necessary? Thank you very much.
Jeffy Jeff. What's up? Into round two. So uh, before we uh, give kind of review there, I wanted to hit a, a, a couple of the, uh, the, the comments here. Um, but first and foremost, uh, Cooper Gates, $5 super chat, um, and was asking a question um, about Zach or for Zach. And uh, I'll, I'll, I will, um, I'll, I'll screen capture that um, and save it for the end. We are going to have a QA. and a um, but I do want to make sure we recognize your super chat. Um, thank you very much for that. Uh, and um, like I said, we'll um, we'll come back around to that at the end. So I don't think do not want you to think we're ignoring you um, uh, at all. But a couple of, a couple of things real quick. Uh, Zach and Randolph's info. Uh, any 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 place you want to find them? Anything you need to know about them is going to be in the description. Um, uh, Zach's uh, YouTube page and Randolph has some uh, a link and everything in there. Uh, you can check them out there. And uh, we want to uh, uh, go through some of the chat here and make sure we're giving the proper kudos because we got a lot of people hanging out tonight. And I'm uh, I'm not going to get to everybody, but um, uh, if I don't, I apologize. But uh, CH15, uh, Adam, Christina Taft, uh, Samuel, do nothing, do little. Uh, Cooper Gates, uh, Enigma, Josh, Geo Sam, uh, Titan's in there. Oh, you Titan, your anus, um, is here. Uh, let's see, anybody else? Was, uh, Joshua Phillips, uh, lots of new I names. I saw Captain Dad pull in there too. Uh, the uh, the legend Biff Saunders, uh, is actually hanging out. Uh, Captain Dad pull, the homie. Uh, let's see. Yeah, for the sake of time, I'm not going to keep scrolling too much further up. Geo Sam, Geo Sam. Uh, Ian, as always, Eddie Krum de la Crum uh, with us, <laughs> uh, hanging out. Thank you guys so much uh, for being in the chat. And uh, uh, now's probably the time you keep listening to us. Uh, refill your popcorn, refill your drink. Uh, but round two, Jeff, give me your review. I mean, Randolph's going to have me convinced of polytheism here shortly. <laughs> but it's an interesting concept because um you know i i think where I, if i remain neutral i'm not an anti-theist i don't necessarily believe there is no god um and i think there are some good arguments for an ultimate being that that is nece- necessity but yeah i don't i've never really thought about the single versus multiple and why multiple might or might not make more sense than a singular um so that's that's an interesting thing for me to ponder upon and then um i appreciate um I appreciate Zach taking the time to to clarify about the double blind studies. Um, that's that's definitely something that we should look into and we should question just as he has. So I appreciate him, uh, even though this is not my debate. Like you know, I want to make sure I'm not saying things <laughs> that you're responding to. But yeah, um, I think it's it, it's a good question to to answer. So yeah, um, and well, J- Jeff, um, you and I do do. Um... Uh, do, do try or at least try to do a good job of keeping it neutral. But if one side, just like the last debate, like the the the, the, the theist at the end of the day end up slapping around the the atheist. Yeah, we're, I don't like that. Um, I have to. Not- I know. I'm joking. For those, everybody said I was being too mean to Eddie. We know Eddie. Eddie's friends of ours. We can we can we can <laughs> just with with Eddie. He knows. Yeah, yeah, and and we we said it. the 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 theist uh, the theist slapped the atheist around at the end of it, uh, and you know the, the one thing about debates is it, we don't necessarily have to ar- agree with the argument or agree with the point. It is uh, who, who best uh, um, you know give who who best presents their argument. You know who who, who put it together uh, and who made uh, the most convincing argument for their case doesn't mean I agree with it, but who was most convincing? Um, and even like the last debate, uh, the, the the Christian definitely won, and we have no problem saying that here on this channel. So, uh, but there's one I wanted to pull up here, and then we're going to transition so the guys get back into it. Uh, so, gonna go for it, uh, Tart. What's up with these interruptions? It's highly annoying and messes with the flow of the debate. Uh, First of all, thank you for your honest feedback. Seriously, uh, we we do value that. Uh, what what we found is uh, some people do appreciate it because it, t- it gives them a chance to, if they want to, use the restroom, get something to drink. Uh, kind of breaks up the uh, breaks up the just the on you know just an hour and a half, two hours of straight conversation, and it gives the two people that are debating a chance to get a drink of water, you know, get up and stretch, do whatever they want to do, and then yeah, and then refocus. So that's that's why we do it. But. Uh, Jeff, let's uh, um, let's get back to it and not waste uh, wasting anybody else. We don't want to waste time. his time you know? um, <laughs> because um, yeah, because this uh, this shit sucks. So uh, Rand- Randolph and um, uh, Zach will bring you guys back on, and as soon as you guys start talking, I will hit the clock. They have forty minutes of open dialogue. Let's do this thing.
Hey, <laughs> did you stretch? Sorry. I'm unmuted. I, 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 I disagree with the chatter. I really do enjoy the breaks. It's actually good to kind of get everything together. Um, yeah. But, it's um, to good about to finally that. be able to interact with you. Um, it's been a minute. Um, so, I thought the previous period was that. I didn't mean to interrupt you earlier, so that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're all, you're all good. It happens. All right. So we have 40 minutes. I feel like, okay, so it'd be most helpful, I think, for everyone. Let's just walk through these three arguments because um, we, we, we threw a lot of stuff out there. Um, and I'd be curious because you, you threw a lot of things out there, but I'm still kind of missing like um, some of your necessary objections. We can we could kind of talk about that if that sounds good to you. Sure. Yeah. Right. So, um, the first argument I brought forth is Proust's argument from contingency that there's a necessary being, and this necessary being would be God. Um, you you brought the idea like maybe there's multiple gods or a few different things, but it seemed like to me you'd accept everything up to premise four and you and you deny that the necessary being is necessarily um god so like wh where do you disagree um with the with the argument and i can reread it if you um well don't, i, I made some notes so you're saying and you can correct me if i'm wrong but like your necessity be a necessary being explains why there's something rather than nothing right a necessary being would explain contingent facts i think is a better way of doing it um and i okay, guess so that's the usual question of why is there something rather than nothing yeah, so your first premise that every contingent fact has an explanation. Can you tell me what you mean by contingent fact? Sure, sure, sure. That's a great question. Um, so I think the most simple definition of a contingent fact um, is something that could happen or not. It's merely possible. Um, like I'd say, for example, like my own existence is a contingent fact. Um, it was possible that there's a world where I don't exist. Um, so I'd say that I'm contingent because I, I depend on something else. It's possible that I may not exist. And I'd argue that every contingent fact would have an explanation for its existence. So I ha have an explanation coming from my parents. So you're not dealing just with facts that have uh, that are valid. You're dealing with something that there's a possibility of it. Right. I mean, I once like, again, I can you're just dealing with hypothetical in a way. Well, contingent facts are they're things in reality that could happen or they could have not happened. They're just po they're mere possibilities. These are, well, I guess, these are things that you would consider to be a normal thing to expect to happen. Then, no, I would say, like once again here, um, contingent facts are things that maybe could have happened or they could have not. Uh, take for example, like I, I brought forth, um, like my existence or maybe like this AirPods case. Does this case exist out of like necessity? I would say no, and I think you would agree with me. Um, it depends on something else. It could have just not existed. Um, it depends on an outside explanation for its existence being a contingent fact. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm just trying to understand because the term contingent fact is a new one to me. Um, I, I, yeah, it's it seems like um, would you say that every fact has an explanation at least? No, I would say every contingent fact has an explanation. Um, necessary facts don't have outside explanations because they're necessary. Um, so every contingent fact has an explanation. Okay, so in a way, you're dealing with a hypothetical here as well. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it's hypothetically true. I'd say it's true. It's it's this thing in philosophy called the principle of sufficient reason. There's so many different versions of it, but I can use a very weak version of it, which just says that every contingent fact has an explanation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I, I'm I'm wrestling with with what contingent fact means. It's still not very clear to me. Uh, I'm just going to take a quick look and see if I can find something that uh, describes it. Uh, I, I'm not dissatisfied with you or anything. Uh, I'm just uh, trying to make uh, make sense of this uh, concept myself. Uh, I'm seeing. Okay, in philosophy and logic, contingency is the status of propositions that are neither true under very every possible evaluation nor false under every possible valuation. Mm -hmm. A contingent proposition is neither necessarily true nor necessarily false. Right, exactly. So I can clarify here, um, do I exist in every possible world? I would say no, there's possible worlds where I don't exist. And then I think it's another way of deducing like what's contingent versus what's necessary is like my own existence doesn't have to exist. There's possible worlds where I don't exist. Um, so I, I'd be contingent, um, we could draw okay. that many different other things. So the concept of contingency seems reasonable to me, but calling it a fact seems to, to me, when those words are put together, it feels like it's narrowing things down to say, okay, these are, these are actual facts we're dealing with, um, not just possibility. So it's, it's a bit confusing, the term. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, perhaps, perhaps you can give me an example, uh, if you don't mind, of, um, of, something that would qualify as contingent fact um, that 
uh, doesn't have an explanation, or you're saying every contingent fact has an explanation. Yeah, um, I mean, I can read the argument for you again, but the premise one, every contingent fact has an explanation. Yeah, I've got that in my notes here, and so I'm, I'm having problems accepting that because of that term contingent fact, and uh, uh, that, that's that's a tough one because it. From what you're saying to me, it seems hypothetical, but you're saying it's not. So that, no, that's it's, it's, I'd say it's in reality. Every contingent fact has an explanation. And I think um, we can back that by reason. I think it's a fundamental part of scientific inquiry. Um, when we're looking into, like, say, something like, uh, why did this pen drop? It's because there's an explanation for why this pen dropped. Um, well, you're looking so for a range of options. What do you mean? Would a contingent fact, like, would a range of possible options qualify as a contingent fact? No, because um, that's we're getting, I think, modal logic here. Um, modal okay. logic is kind of thinking, like, what are the possible realities we live in? Um, premise one is very simple. If there is a contingent fact, I think we've kind of gone through contingencies. Every contingent fact has an explanation. Maybe we'll need to get back to this one because I'm I'm having trouble with, with the definition there. Um, it's just not working for me um, because uh, uh, I'll give it one more quick try, though. Um, if you notice a fact about the world, you can put it in one of two categories, necessary or contingent. A necessary fact is one that has to be the case, whereas mm -hmm. contingent facts could have been different. Okay, so again, it's uh, it looks to me like there's uh, there's a realm of possibilities there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say contingency has, and if I'm contradicting myself, I put my apologies, but like oh, contingency oh. deals with things that possibly could have not existed or could have not come into being. That's the whole nature of contingency, I would say. And necessary okay. things, like I'd argue the necessary... I think you can accept one through four and get to a necessary being. Um, and then necessary being is something that doesn't depend on an explanation. It's something that exists because it has to exist. I'm just trying to make sure I understand what the first premise is. Um, so to me, it looks like it's talking about, uh, again, the hypothetical. That's where I keep coming back to. So I, I'm, I'm having trouble with why this is not looking at the hypothetical, looking at the different possibilities. So it almost looks like the first premise is, is one that's not even necessary in this argument. Um, well, I think it is necessary because if we get to like the third premise, it says there's an explanation of this fact, which is it includes all contingencies. Um, that would have to be the case if premise one is true. Every contingent fact has an explanation. I'm, I'm, I don't... I get mean, you don't understand maybe necessarily premise one, which is based on like the principle of sufficient reason, but I'm not really seeing any objection to it. I'm just seeing like- well, I'm trying to understand it clearly. And I'm, I'm struggling with the term contingent fact um, that that's all because uh, uh, that word contingency in there seems to be kind of, it's, it's kind of making this a very, very broad thing. So um, if there is a contingent, okay, there is a contingent fact on premise two, uh, that includes all other contingent facts. Mm -hmm. All right. Can you give me an example of that one? So that's sure. even more broad, it seems. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it's using um, just kind of like thinking about things and using like philosophy. Um, it's developed, if you guys want to look this up, it's called the Big Conjective Contingent Fact, the BCCF. Um, Rob Coons has done a lot of work in this. Um, Alex Proust has. Okay. And it's basically thinking like we can imagine, let's just say there's this big blob of everything. Um and it's all these facts that are contingent, right? We just we just imagine all contingent facts. It would seem like if every contingent fact has an explanation, um, well, no, I'm jumping to premise three here. All I have to do for premise two is say that we can just think of this big blob of everything, which includes all contingent facts. That'd be this contingent fact that contains all contingencies. Sorry, I was jumping ahead. To the cosmos. Um, sure, if you want to say, like, you can go to premise four here. Um, and just go with the cosmos. And I think well, that's hang on, let's 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 not skip premise three. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. You're good. You're good. <laughs> so, um, so if we're going to say there's a contingent fact, say the cosmos is that fact uh, sure. that includes all other contingent facts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and cause the cosmos is is absolutely everything, including all universes, etc. Mm -hmm. If there happened to be more than one universe, then that would include all universes. Mm -hmm. so Let's say everything in the universe, including the universe, is contingent. Then yeah. that would be yeah, that, that fits. Okay. I'm fine with that. So okay, yeah. So I, I think we can probably go along with these. Uh, so because these are more definitional anyway. Um, mm -hmm. So number three is the interesting one. Therefore, there's an explanation of this fact. So w the explanation of this fact will be an interest is, is where things start to turn here. Then, okay. So um, this explanation, according to premise four, is uh, this explanation must involve a necessary being. And so my question is. 
what makes the being necessary for this. Right, right. So it's helpful to understand that when we think of being, we think of something like us, um, something that like thinks. Um, you don't for the necessary like being part. That's just like philosophical jargon for like the necessary foundation. It doesn't necessarily have to be something conscious um, to accept premise four. I don't think of beings as being limited to Tellarians, uh, inhabitants of Earth. Uh, all the different species. Like, and if you want to argue that the necessary being is a rock, like you can do no, that. No. I don't think anyone would do that. But like in this in this argument, a being doesn't have to be something conscious, doesn't have to be human, doesn't have to be God. Um, it can just be like a rock or energy or quantum fluctuations or an infinite regress, any of these um, possibilities. So I think being can get okay. mistaken sometimes if you're not super familiar with the argument. It's like it has to be something conscious. That's not the case. Um, yeah, like absolutely nothing might work. <laughs> sure, if you want to argue that that's your necessary <laughs> being. Um, Back to this again. Okay. That. <laughs> um, so... There, you're saying that the skeptics stop at this premise, and and what what are you finding that is the reason they stop at this one? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. Um, I would say, um, we're already at like 12 minutes. I don't want to get too far into the weeds in this and miss the other arguments. So let's move on in like a minute or two, and it's kind of good we're getting to the end of the argument. No but problem. Like, why think? Why do skeptics stop at this and kind of go with like, well, maybe there's an infinite regress or um, Graham Oppie who's brilliant. It's like, well, there's there's these, just these brute facts, um, something along those lines. And I mean, I think it's because like, first off, they're atheists, so they're not going to accept um, the conclusion that God exists. So they're going to have some sort of other necessary being. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of different understandings of like what this necessary being would be. And if you're um, going to argue that there is, and I know you're not arguing this personally, but if you're one of these um, skeptics who would stop at this premise and say that it's something else other than God, they'd argue that maybe it's simpler or something along those lines. Um, so there's a lot of loops you can go through. Infinite regress. I wonder how that would factor into any of this. Well, I mean, you could argue that there's this regress that's just necessary. Um, but hmm. yeah. So uh, we have like a minute left before I'd love to get on to some other arguments. Um, yeah, it, it's something I'm going to bring up. It seems like to me, just just sorry to interrupt. There's not, I haven't really seen an, obje I, I'm guessing you'd hop off at four, but I'm not really seeing an objection to one, two, and three. You've just kind of had like questions. Um, so. Well, maybe you want me to hop off at four, but I want to ask you about number five because you're saying this necessitates God. Yeah. And I'm curious how all of this uh, proves God. Yeah, yeah, this is great. This is great. Um, yeah, this is the heart of the whole argument. It's like, it's like there's two stages. There's like one, there's a necessary being, and two is um, this necessary being is God. And we could talk like for like 20 hours on this. Um, but like why, uh, very briefly, I just brought forth an argument from limits. I think that all arbitrary limits depend on outside explanations. So the, so the foundation wouldn't be arbitrarily limited. It would be limitless. Um, and I think a limited, limitless foundation would have all power since it brings everything into existence, being the necessary foundation. Um, it'd be personal because it would bring everything into existence. I know I threw a lot at you. Um, so if you want to push back, that's fine. But I would like to move on to some other arguments here um, very soon. Okay. Yeah. So the, where I'm having problems with this is at point five, because all the stuff before it doesn't seem to point to the God of Christianity. I, I, I assume that's the one that you're promoting in this. You're assuming in this. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Well, I mean, it doesn't have to be the God of Christianity. I, I want the dots connected, and I'm I'm not seeing the dots being connected for this fifth premise, or okay. the, or the point five. I guess was the conclusion. This necessitates God. I'm not seeing the dots being connected there. And that that's I guess that would be my objection. That's where I'm stuck with this. So okay. how would you respond to the problem of arbitrary limits? What is the problem of arbitrary limits? So arbitrary limits is what I was bringing up before. Like the foundation is limitless because all limits we encounter is arbitrary. Um, so the foundation. Um, whatever it may be, wouldn't be arbitrary limited by some set of like atoms or super strings or particles or anything along these lines, because all limits depend on other um, explanations. I don't see those as arbitrary. I see those as just facts of nature. Well, I mean, it's very easily conceivable. There could be maybe like one more unit of energy if that was your necessary foundation or some particle or super string or something along those lines. Okay. Um... Uh, is has there been a demonstration of that anywhere does there need to be i mean i think that um first off all in our experience every limit we encounter is is a product of other other limits so i think that is demonstrated hmm. even if yeah and uh the limit of photons being able to move at a particular speed and not very much faster than that uh before breaking down um is seems to me a fact not necessarily 
uh, an arbitrary uh, limit that's dependent on other limits. Right. Um, I'll, I'll just give one more thought here because I really would like to move on here. I know there's so much here. No problem. Um, no problem. But, um, what I'm arguing for arbitrary limits is things like particle superstrings or matter, um, the amount of them. Like there's no cutoff. Um, I'm not, I think you're talking like the laws of the cosmos, and that's fine. Like uh, I think it's independent. Of physics the, I was talking about, but okay. 15 minutes. I thought we said um, 40 minutes. I, according to my time. Yeah, we I remember 40 minutes. minutes is what they said. So um, Yeah, but, I'm planning but, on 25 and if, we're wrong. Please interrupt me. And I apologize for sounding like very demanding. I'm, no not, problem. Um, but I would say that like, we're talking about arbitrary limits. Um, 45 minutes. Okay. So when we're talking There's about an arbitrary I'm, limit, <laughs> I'm talking about like things that like with cutoffs, like particles, I don't think particles are the necessary foundation because there's no um, necessary cutoff in the amount of particles that was used in the foundation. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess the reason why to think that would be true. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we can move on. We can move on if you want, and we can cover sure. that argument again and give our closing thoughts. I'd love to talk to you about fine tuning because there's a lot of fun sure. stuff there. Yeah, sure. Let's let's go on to fine tuning then. William Lane Craig is uh, famous, so yeah, sure. Let's do that. Yeah, and I thought about doing a probabilistic argument, like um, under theism, fine tuning is expected; under atheism, fine tuning is not expected. But I feel like um, just for like this yeah. debate, like Craig's argument is probably the most simple way. Mm -hmm. To kind of do the fine tuning arguments, I kind of like to hear where you jump off and like what you disagree with. So it should be a lot of fun. So the fine tuning argument, um, I guess um, uh, you had uh, laid it out. I think. Um, sorry, my notes don't cover everything here. But uh, did you um, uh, did you want to go over the fine tuning argument? Just quickly review it first. Sure, sure, sure. All right. So the fine tuning argument that I presented, um, premise one, the fine tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. Um, premise two is not due to physical necessity or chance. Um, the conclusion, therefore, it is due to design. That's the argument I presented. Okay. I think it works. I think there's better formulations of it, like in like more how Robin Collins would do it. But I think this form also works. So I'd love to hear like what your thoughts are. Okay, so physical necessity is is interesting. Um, what? Uh, why do you call it physical necessity? Right. So um, some people would argue that like maybe the constants. Um, maybe with the early universe, like I brought forth in the debate, I brought forth one in the constants and one in the early universe conditions. But some people, like I think Graham Oppie would do this, would argue that these constants are just necessary. Um, they exist at the certain like number that they do um, because they just have this necessary component to them where they had to be this way. Um, so that's what I mean by physical necessity is like the gravitational, uh, the low entropy uh, was 10 to the 123rd because yeah. necessarily that was the case. Okay, well, that that seems a reasonable number based on what we know. Um, mm -hmm. So, the universe is due either to physical necessity or chance. It is not due to physical necessity or chance. Seems to be a contradiction of that first premise. Oh, okay, so it's an either or. It's it's one of those mm -hmm. two things. So yeah, it's bringing up these three options here, and it's like, well, these two fail, so this is the conclusion. Oh, so you think they fail? Necessity, physical necessity, and chance fail. Right. Yeah. But, and uh, uh, why do you think they fail? Sure. So I brought this up in my opening statement. Yeah. Um, first off, phys physical necessity. Uh, let's just talk about the principle of indifference for a second here. You guys can look this up if you're current. This is part of Pagian statistics. I brought this up in my opening statement. And cool. the principle of indifference states that in the absence of any relevant evidence, agents should distribute their credence or degrees of belief equally among all possible outcomes under consideration. Um, I have, a, I have a, just a quote here from Robin Collins that will lead kind of talking about like why I think that fine tuning isn't physical necessity um, based off of like this idea in Bayesian statistics. And here's his quote. Um, he's one of the leading theistic experts in fine tuning. So lots of fun there. I um, mean, in the case of fine tuning, we have no more reason to think that the parameters of physics will fall within the life prohibiting permitting range than any other range, given the atheistic single universe hypothesis. That's according to the principle of indifference, equal ranges of these par parameters should be e assigned equal probabilities. So are these people saying that they know what the ranges of these fine tuning parameters could possibly be? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, we could easily concede that these constants could have been different. Um, I think that most people would agree that like, yeah, we could conceive of maybe like the gravitational constant being weaker or stronger. We could um, consider like the volume of the low entropy of the universe. It could have been larger. It could have been smaller. Um, yeah, so I think that like we can conceive of differences in the absence of any kind of like undercutting defeater, we should assign these equal probabilities. Like, um, I think a good example is let's say I have like 
this coin here, um, my grandfather's old coin. It's like heads or tails. I can only flip it once. Let's say I flip it. I got heads. You didn't see that. I'm sorry. Um, should we assign that since we can only flip this coin once, the probability of it always landing on heads is one? Okay. I would think no, um, just because the principle of indifference here. Mm. Okay, yeah, so if we don't have all the information, we it makes it difficult for us to, to predict things accurately. Um, concern I have with uh, uh, with this is, uh, while it's, it's certainly interesting to consider the possibility of different uh, universal constants, uh, I really uh, wonder um, how effective, uh, I'm not convinced that that's even possible to me. Like, I, I think for that claim to have credibility that it would be possible for those constants to have been changed, um, we're going to need to be able to prove that somehow. We're, at this point, it's only kind of a an idea. It's not uh, not something. I'm, like, I'm not close to considering it, but. Uh, my understanding is that, like Richard Carrier was talking about this before, he was saying that with, um, uh, if say the the gravitation, the constant of gravity was changed a little bit, um, things wouldn't all suddenly be crushed and or or suddenly all be falling apart. There's still a lot of other uh, factors involved that help keep things together. Um, sure, we'd have a stronger gravity, um, and we'd, we may have evolved in creatures much like ourselves possibly it still would have evolved into an environment with a stronger gravitational force, a gravitational pull, and, and still been able to function and, and survive. For all we know, there could be other planets with, uh, with the stronger gravity already that's, uh, uh, that's got uh, uh, species living on there that are much stronger than us. But to them, if they look at what we're doing and lifting weights and doing different things, probably they would end up thinking, oh, that's the same for them, not really noticing any difference until they come and actually encounter the different gravitational force. So there's, I think there's a lot more to this that needs to be understood. And, and I would like to see some, uh, some really uh, solid ideas on what will happen if some of these constants have changed. And uh, I, I'm not, I, I'm just not seeing it. It's, it just doesn't, uh, what we have is 100% in this, re in reality, we're seeing how things are. Right. All right. So there's, there's a few things you brought up there. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm just trying to think about how to kind of progress through this. First off, um, ugh, sorry, there's just a lot. Um, with verification, verification, you know, like we should be able to verify uh, or something like that. You can't verify that statement. That's a You're making a philosophical statement to base um, the idea that you need to verify things on, but you can't verify your own statement um empirically at least it's just kind of like a philosophical basis you go off of mm -hmm. that's no reason sure. why we're just going based off of that like why is your philosophical basis better than mine well that's I why i call it an idea at this point yeah sure and i think i think that kind of argument that we need to we need we i mean verifying is helpful but i don't yeah. think it's i don't think we need to because if we needed to we couldn't verify your own statement that we need to verify claims and that'd be kind of just self-refuting um sure. so it's helpful but i wouldn't think i don't think it's necessary um well, I think what makes it necessary is to validate the argument's conclusion that it's due to design and that uh, physical necessity and chance are therefore ruled out. So would you say that um, we need to verify truth claims about things? I, I think when it comes to the fine-tuning argument that if, if you want to uh, uh, prove that those, to, to validate the, the idea that those uh, that physical necessity and chance are, are are ruled out as invalid, then that's going to need to be verifiable because that's a pretty big claim. And to say it's due to design, we, we need we need something more definite than just ideas on this. What would that evidence look like? I would like to see see some evidence of how these things actually have failed, and um, I want to see something more convincing than just a simple assumption that uh, things are uh, that everything is designed. Well, it's not an assumption. It's looking the fine tuning argument. We're looking at these different kind of conceptions of why are the constants the way they are? Um, is it because mm -hmm. of physical necessity? Is it because of chance? Is it due to design? And I think we can rule out physical necessity by the principle of indifference. And I think we can rule out chance when we look at like when you combine the dozens of fine tuning examples. Um, I think we can kind of rule out chance. I do want to clarify. I remember what I was going to say earlier with the gravitational constant. I think it's helpful to remember. I'm not arguing about the gravity on Earth. I'm sure. talking about the gravitational constant at the um, 
foundation of the like one, as the initial conditions of the universe at the constants. Um, so nothing like gravi what gravitons do. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I understand. Um, so again, it's making a conclusion that uh, physical necessity and chance are are, are not uh, are not valid. So uh, well, I mean, I brought reason. I didn't say I just didn't assume it. I gave you reason. I said the principle of difference and the sheer improbability sure. are good reasons to rule out the physical necessity. Um, it's an argument, effectively. but it's not convincing enough. We need to actually be able to test this and validate this to say the fine tuning argument has the credibility. And uh, I, uh, an argument is fine. It's it's philosophical at this stage, but um, I want to see that this is actually the case. We want to see that. Uh, a scenario where physical necessity and chance actually has failed and that uh, the only possible option is design and that it can't be explained by uh, by some other means. So right, right, right. the watchmaker argument and whatnot here. No, I would, well, I would say this is nothing like the watchmaker argument, I would say, I think is very different. Okay. Um, I, I would like to clarify, because I think we're kind of, I'd love to get to the argument for miracles. There's a lot of fun stuff there. Sure. Okay. Second. I would say, we can, in a sense, test how different constants would play out. Um, I was talking with, I believe it was Luke Barnes um, in the past, who's an astrophysicist. I think he got his degree at Cambridge. Um, he's talking about, like, how do we model, because he's a big guy on fine-tuning, how do we understand, like, different, how if the constants were different, what would happen? Well, we have computer simulations. So I think we can test and um, verify if the constants are maybe these certain examples, things fall apart and nothing um, forms together, and there's no kind of life that could exist. Um, so I would say that we can test if these constants are different um, in certain degrees, then we have a universe where there's no life of any kind that can develop. So I would say we test that. And I would say overall with the project, like if you're just not convinced, like, I mean, that's fine on a personal level, Randolph. Like if you're just not convinced, I can't like force you to be convinced. That's not like, sure. um, po that's not possible, but that's not an argument. That's just you not being convinced. It's not a reason for well, me to doubt. It's just, and um, just if I could finish here, please, I'm sorry. Um, no, it's okay. Yeah, you like. Let's just say you presented a bunch of evidence for the theory of evolution, and I, I personally have no problem for if, with this, with accepting evolution. Mm -hmm. but let's say you bring a bunch of it, and, you, and I'm just like, well, right off, that's cool, but I'm just not convinced. You see, if I, you'd have to verify it for me. I need this exact transition fossil to prove to me that evolution is true. And if you don't, well, I'm just not convinced. Like, that's not an argument against evolution. That's just just you not yeah. being convinced. Oh sure, yeah. I'm hopeful to move on, so I'll let you like finish this fine well, tuning, and I'd love to move on to miracles. So yeah, so I'm sorry for interrupting you. Sorry. I, well, you didn't interrupt. It's fine. <laughs> um, this is back and forth. It's normal. I would like to see to answer your question, uh, an actual universe with different constants, and and see what the outcome is. And we don't seem to have access to that. That's why I say this is just in the philosophical realm, just an idea. It's not um, It's not proven in my view because of that. We don't actually have anything solid to verify this with. Computer simulations are helpful, but reality is different and computer simulations can also be wrong. I work in computers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Okay, um, I'll respond to that in my closing. But I'd love to move on to miracles. Um, <laughs> What are your thoughts on the argument for miracles? I'd love to talk about the study you brought up. Um, but before we get into that, is there anything else you want to bring up from in terms of the argument for miracles? Well, um, miracles, from my understanding, what I've seen, what I've understood from miracles uh, is that they're all anecdotal reports. Uh, there's uh, there's report of, I think, Jesus healing a blind person once and, and uh, another time where he turned water into wine and, and different things like that. Um, uh, an anecdote isn't all that reliable, unfortunately. Uh, it's possible that people could do a magic trick to make things look like something else. And there's many different ways that those can be done. Matt Dillahunty goes into that quite a bit. He's talked about uh, uh, how to how to use magical techniques to, to make things appear like they're out of thin air and whatnot. And uh, and that's true. We see people, there's, uh, um, uh, what's the fellow's name? Chris something or other, um, a younger fellow in Las Vegas. He walked across water and then people went into the water and found nothing in there. Uh, it was quite uh, quite an incredible display. Um, sorry about that. Popular man. No, <laughs> it's for somebody else. <laughs> uh, <laughs> shucks. Um, so I have questions about. 
I, I, I'm, I'm thinking when I see this, this argument, miracles happen. Um, it's saying if miracles happen, God exists. And so this right now, I think, reduces the, the scope to limits the scope to God uh, created mir miracles that were created by God or, or executed by God or, or, or done by God somehow. Um, and then the next one is just miracles happen. That's a claim. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, All right. All right. Yeah. And are you good at anything else before I kind of respond? But I think if uh, if miracles happen can actually be proven and, and reproducible in the lab, so to speak, um, then, of course, uh, miracles that are created by God. And then that can give a lot of credibility to the, the final uh, uh, conclusion there. So uh, the sticking point on that one is number two. Right, right, right. OK, so. Yeah, there's a lot. First, I want to talk about the study that you talked about, because um, you claim okay. that. You said that, and the study debunked um, kind of my previous studies. I would disagree with that because I think to debunk my study, you'd have to prevent, present some sort of like defeater to my studies. All you've brought is a different study kind of contradicting um, what I've said. So right now it seems like to mm -hmm. me, um, at the worst for my position, we have one study that says, yeah, there's this um, significance of prayer in a double line study, and this other side where prayer does nothing. So at best we're neutral, um, but I would say that I think there's something that said about the size. The size isn't that different. Like I was looking at the study. Um, I think in the, in this study you have about two thousand people being studied. In the yeah. one article, and in, in the one in the one I presented, um, the one in 1988, you have about four hundred people, and then the one that I have in 2001, you have about a thousand people. So yeah. I don't think we can just dismiss um, my two because yours had a little bit larger quantity like there's margins of errors on these things for a reason um so i don't think we can just dismiss that so like why i think the question becomes then why do we have these couple studies that show that prayer seems to to, to some degree help in another one where it seems like there's just no difference like i think i have no problem admitting in that's in the study that you talked about there's no it, it seems like prayer doesn't do anything and i think we just consider god as a free agent god isn't obligated to work like uh, a law of physics where he has to do something if something happens like for this one study he may have healed some more people and for this other study that you bring up he may have just chosen to do what he normally does and it didn't make any difference like i think that's fine well, i don't I mean, have the information handy but i do remember reading that one of the reasons this new study uh came about was because the previous ones had been debunked there were some problems with the way they were carried out and uh, some flaws in them and so uh they were much more careful with the new study to 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 make sure things were actually done properly um i'm sorry i don't have the information but that's uh, uh that's something i do recall reading so right well i mean if i'd have to see that data like yeah. i can't like i I'll can't just find say, it, like, yeah, you I can't it right now you yeah. found something that says this is debunked well okay but you haven't given me like this data but, i do think that this is more of like a probabilistic argument like i think like if God exists, we'd expect prayer to um, happen, to be fulfilled. Yeah. If God doesn't exist, we'd ex we wouldn't expect it. So it seems like what's happening in this evidence is just it's in line with God existing. I think that um, this just kind of serves like in a more evidential way. I think so, that the other two arguments are more powerful. And I think this argument just kind of fits with like what we'd expect if the other two arguments are true. Well, the thing is, we have... Um uh this idea that people can pray to their god and then god will uh deviate from his master plan for everything being omniscient knowing everything and uh, make an exception and help somebody out more and they call that a miracle it's a it, my understanding is it's not part of the the master plan can I, can I clarify here yeah so i would i would say maybe that's somewhere else where you heard a miracle defined that's not how i would define a miracle um okay. in my opening statement i i defined a miracle as an event that would occur if metaphysic an event that would not occur if metaphysical naturalism is true and that's like the idea there's a cause and close system there's no god um so I'm, all i'm saying is a miracle is an event that that would not occur if that if the causally closed system was true so, so does that does that eliminate the necessity of prayer then i don't see any reason why it would why would it so so then if that's the case then uh why should anybody pray for these miracles they should just happen on their own right well i don't see how that challenges the argument at all i think you're maybe like bringing in an objection to prayer in a sense like how like what is the usefulness of prayer well you, but it doesn't challenge any of the evidence well, that i brought forth at least from you, my you did raise the power of prayer with those studies as uh, evidence for the miracles mm -hmm. yeah 
So that's I, I, I do think that that's relevant. Oh, okay. That's why. That's why so I'm, saying, I'm like, raising this. Like why? Like why pray if God already knows everything? Well, yeah. If 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 God has if God is omniscient, then then God knows what's going to happen next and mm -hmm. is not going to be able to change that. Right. right. Well, no. Well, he would. All right. So there's there's a lot of things at play here. One is your theory of yep. time. Um, I'd love to talk about the one God, two God thing. So I'll give you my response here very briefly, and then you can respond. And I'd love to talk about that in the last few minutes. I think there's yeah, some issues sure. there. Um, but all I would say to that is as a Christian, we're instructed to pray. So I pray. Like, I don't think that like, maybe like, I think God can know the future, but that doesn't mean um, God knowing the future doesn't mean that he can, he has to act in the same way. Like, I think God, God's free. God can do what he wants and he'll know what he, and he can know what he freely will do. And there's no issue with that. I also think I could just be an open theist and kind of get out of everything you're saying. So I don't think this really carries any force um, against the argument, and I'll give you the last word to respond, and then I'll go in my closing because I'd love to talk about the multiple gods thing really briefly. <laughs> Do you think that? Um, uh, so you're, it sounds like you're saying your God knows what's going to happen in the future, but can alter that. I would say God knows all true propositions. So he's not omniscient then. No, he would know all past, present, and future um, truth statements. Anything. So a true statement would be that uh, we're going to have snow in a couple of days, let's say, and the weather prediction says it's going to be snow in a couple of days, and we get snow in a couple of days. Sure, God, sure, sure. Um, I would love to just let, get your final thoughts because I really want to get to this like one God thing because it's really important. Um, so well, this is important too because I'm trying to understand here because if, if God is omniscient and God knows we're going to get snow in a couple of days, um, if God was to change that, then it would be – he didn't know that he's changed it. So he's not actually omniscient anymore. It's a bit of a paradox, don't you think? No, I mean, God knows what all, what, what has happened will happen and is happening. So I don't think there's any issue here. So he knows that we're going to get snowfall, but for some reason he decides to change that at that time that we've got snowfall. Does you're, you're saying that that does not invalidate his omniscience in the past when he knew that that's going to happen. And then he, I mean, if you were, if you had a divine simplicity, maybe, um, but I don't. I just don't see a contradiction here. And I mean, you could just be an open theist, and God would still exist, and this argument would still hold, even if you your argument did hold. Um, but I really would like to get to this. We have like two minutes left. I'd really like okay. To get to this. Let's, let's get on to the next one. Go ahead. No, Fire. Sorry, I'm really sorry. Shoot. I just no problem. Shoot. Ahead. So, my question for you is, in asserting multiple deities, why assert um, that multiple limited de deities are just as valid? Um, multiple arbitrary limited deities are just as um, valid as just one maximally great unlimited being like oh, why i didn't say they were limited i didn't say they were limited so these beings are both maximally great sure why not well let's say, if they have they could be, i said they could both be omnipotent and uh omniscient they could share well, these they this, and they have unique minds is that what you'd say no they're separate individuals but they they all know what's coming so why change it well I don't see why you'd posit this extra being. It seems like it's just like an extra like commitment. Um, arbit like why assert that there's two? Like, I don't see any reason to think there would be two. Mm -hmm. um, one's, a, one's a simpler explanation. Why, why think there's two maximally great beings when one would do the job just fine? Like we have Occam's razor. Share the workload. <laughs> I mean, that's funny, um, but I don't think that's really a counter argument. But, yeah, and, I, and I'm not limiting just to two. There could be multiple. But I, I'm curious, why couldn't uh, multiple deities share uh, the same traits of omniscience and omnipotence as just one? Well, I think you have to pose multiple minds. Um, what happens if that deity fails? Then nothing. But if you have multiple deities and one fails, the others can fix it. Maybe. Well, I'd argue that God is perfect, so God could never fail. Um, so I don't think that kind of, I don't think that would hold. If God, so God has never failed. Well, what do you mean by fail? Like, I think God's perfect, um, so I don't think He can perfect. just be like, "Oh, if I didn't know that was going to happen, I made a mistake." Oh, like we flooded the world and started over. That wasn't correcting mistake. Well, I wouldn't argue that God. I go. I I hold to like a more partial Earth flood, so I wouldn't think that God flooded the whole Earth. I wouldn't hold to that position. Oh, okay, so you disagree with the Bible on that? Okay, 
No, no. I disagree with man's interpretation of the Bible. Oh, okay. Okay. So, because that's so common, people interpret that that way, and that's what I'm hearing from you. You're the first to tell me it's not a, a complete global flood. That's this is yeah, a, it's a very it's a very rich tradition. There's lots of people who yeah. would assert that the flood was partial. Um, John Walton's a great scholar, inspiring philosophy, the YouTuber. It's a very rich tradition. It's not. It's not. I mean, it's not the most common belief, but it's definitely not just like something that just I believe. Now, a lot of people apparently and animals died in that flood. Okay. Do you, um, do you take it that way or not? Yes, but I don't see how this relates to multiple deities. Okay. Well, no, it's it's relating to what you're saying about the deity being perfect. Now, I think perfection would mean not killing innocent individuals. Why? Because uh, I think the perfect thing to do is to help innocent individuals instead of killing them off. But that's my standard. But you you think that that a perfect being could kill innocent individuals? And that would still be a perfect deity. Right, right, right. Yeah, there's a lot of great things to bring up here. I don't think we're going to have to get time okay. um, to get through it all as Oz is screaming now in the live chat. But I'll say very briefly. Oh, yes? I'm not watching that, the private chat. Sorry. <laughs> is that if Sorry. God exists um, and there no. really is an afterlife, no one dies. They just change locations. Um, so that's all I'll say on that because there's a we're going to um, okay. be gone. So I'll shut up now. So, yeah, sorry. Jeff and Jeff. All right. Round three. What are your thoughts? Um, you know, pretty good. I, I think we had a, a lot of back and forth, a lot of good, a good con conversation, really. And um, I, I, do, uh, I do wish we could have gotten the miracle stuff a little more because I've, um, I'm always interested to um, hear how that is an argument for the existence of a God. Um, Without without the the sufficient evidence, I guess. I guess so. I, I um I would love to uh love to hear more of that. But again, I have to say it, uh, and I, I hate to beat the dead horse. I do I do appreciate um uh, both parties being uh, prepared. Uh, oh, yeah. And and Zach, you know, after some of the people that we've had come in on the not all, but some of the people that we've had come in on the theist side, we've we've had one or two on the atheist side too. Don't get me wrong, uh, but come in and just you know, ill prepared. It's really nice to have somebody show up, and they they have you know a formatted uh, discussion they want to have. Uh, so that's uh, that's awesome. But a uh, couple plugs here while we let those gentlemen uh, take a deep breath and get a drink of water or something, and, and have a time to uh, collect their thoughts for their closing statements. Um, uh, we we have uh, the um, uh, the show on the seventeenth with uh, Dave Warnock. If I can spit it out here, uh, Dave Warnock. Uh, make sure uh, you come and check us out for that. Uh, and then um, we have uh, the six member uh, panel discussion on who uh, who was Jesus historically. Uh, that's on the twenty third. It's a Saturday. Then that same night after that discussion's over. Uh, we're still trying to figure out, uh, Apostle Mike and I, if we're going to do Zoom or Google Hangouts or whatnot, but we are going to uh, purchase and and uh, watch the Conor McGregor fight that night. And any and all are welcome to come. And if you want to be part of that and just hang out, uh, like I said, we're paying for it. You don't have to worry. But the only thing you need to buy is your alcohol or your drinks, whatever you want to bring to your party. Um, and we'll get you. You have your own TV. <laughs> we're not providing TVs. Yeah. <laughs> TV, computer, phone, whatever you want to be on. Um, make sure you do that. And the easiest way to get on the list for that, just email me, austin at tart.live. Um, we'll get you hooked up. And uh, um, I'm, uh, I'm building a, a spreadsheet, so I make sure I don't lose lose track of anybody. But um, we'd love to have you uh, be a part of that. And then uh, Jeff alluded to it uh, earlier, The uh, myself included, but the the – uh, the Tart team are now creating uh, their own spinoff shows from, you know, the Tart live show, and they'll only they'll all have their own, um, uh, you know, title and premise, uh, you know. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be a spoiler, but I can tell you uh, what they're working on and what they're doing is fucking awesome, and I'm looking forward to it. It's gonna be amazing, uh, and a lot of them pre-recorded, you know, so a lot of, uh, there'll be a lot of good uh, production value in, in those as well, so that's something excited. Uh, we're excited about going, well, we're in it now, for 2021. Uh, we're putting uh, 2020 behind us, and hopefully we'll get past all this uh, COVID bullshit, so uh, 
Jeff, what do you what do you think? Should we uh, bring these bring these gentlemen back on? Yeah, what's next? What what's our next part? Yep. So we're going to go into closing statements. Uh, ten minutes. Uh, ten minutes each. And uh, then we'll go to Q&A. So what I'm going to tell you is uh, if you have questions uh, for Randolph, for Zach, start putting them uh, in. And I will do the best I can do. Usually on these debates, they come uh, swarming in. Uh, so I'll try to keep up. Uh, I'll just tell you right now, if, if you super chat, it stays on my screen longer um, and I can I can capture it. Uh, so super chat's the most effective way to make sure that you communicate with uh, the debaters and uh, get your question asked. So without further ado, uh, let's uh, welcome Randolph and Zach back to the screen. Right. So I guess I'll start. Um, so I'll give my closing statement. I think I have 10 minutes, but it probably won't take that long. Uh, but just start. Uh, thank you again, um, Tart, for hosting uh, this debate. It's been a lot of fun. Um, and thank you, um, Randolph, for interlocking with me today. It's a lot of fun. Randolph, great guy. Um, proved to me that Canadians are the nicest people on earth. Uh, always fun to talk with Randolph. Uh, but with that being said, I just want to revisit um, the arguments that were brought forth. As far as I know, um, Randolph provided no um, arguments for what you want to call it, anti-theism or um, atheism, the belief that there is no God. Randolph provided no positive arguments for that. So at best, even if my arguments failed, we're left in the middle with kind of like our own personal experiences. But I think that we have still three positive reasons to think that God exists, and we're going to go through those right now. Um, so first off, the argument from contingency that I brought forth, um, developed by Alexander Proust and Leibniz and all kinds of really smart people. Um, it seems like to me that the first three premises, um, every contingent fact has an explanation. There is a contingent fact that includes all other contingent facts. And therefore, there is an explanation of this fact. It seems like to me, Raynoff didn't really have any kind of objections um, to this. He's just kind of trying to understand it more, which is fine. Um, and then he kind of was like, well, why think that the necessary being is God? Um, and specifically the Christian God. Um, I brought forth an argument from limits that the foundation would not be arbitrarily limited in any way in terms of like atoms or super strings or particles or anything like that. Um, as far as I know, I have not heard a positive reason to think that the foundation would be arbitrarily limited. So I think it's safe for me, at least in this debate, to assume that the foundation isn't and it actually be limitless, at least in the arbitrary sense. Um, well, I think it's the Christian God. Well, that would take a 18 other debates, a lot of fun, um, or maybe someone else's own personal experience. I think that we can look like the facts surrounding Jesus and get there. There's all other kind of fun stuff. Um, but I mean, I don't think like why the Christian God, like the contingency argument runs um, regardless of whether the Christian God or Islamic God or Judaism, God, Judea, the God of Judaism, um, it argues for general monotheism, um, the contingency argument. Uh, the second argument was the fine tuning argument. Um, Randolph would challenge challenge the first premise by saying, um, and I, I hope I'm representing him right, and if he doesn't have a conclusion to represent himself properly, and I look forward to that, and I'm not trying to misrepresent Randolph at all, uh, but he said, well, I think it's just limited um, to physical necessity, chance, or design. Why are these our only, our only three options? Well, I'd say that's the only things we have given our data. Um, if Renoff wants to give a fourth thing or a fifth thing, well, we need to see some reason to believe that. But I mean, I think most people would kind of surround themselves around the idea of um, at least science is around physical necessity, chance or design. Um, well, I think it's not due to physical necessity. I think it's not physically necessary because the principle of indifference, um, very briefly to restate it, the principle of indifference, all it says is it says that the principle of indifference states that in the absence of any relevant evidence, agents should distribute their credence or degrees of belief equally among all possible outcomes under consideration. Um, to this point, I don't think we're enough really given a reason to think that we should um, reject this principle. He's, I haven't heard any relevant evidence that should say I shouldn't distribute my um, probability among all possible outcomes. So I would think that physical necessity would still fail because the principle of indifference. I haven't heard an objection uh, to that yet, besides for the idea that um, it needs to be empirically verified, which is just self-defeating. Uh, scientism, it's just, it fails um, a lot. Um, and then why I think chance? Well, he didn't, I didn't see any really objection to this either. I don't know if you'd agree with it, but I didn't see any objection to the, like, why I think it fails due to chance. So I think we're left with design. Um, so that's the second argument. Third argument was the argument for miracles. I mean, I think this argument holds still. Um, he didn't see, I didn't hear any different, um, this, sorry, I'm fumbling my words here. Um, I didn't hear any disagreement with the first premise. If miracles happen, God exists, but miracles happen. Um, I don't think that 
the studies I have are great, and I think they point towards miracles happening, but I think we can go so much further. Um, if we dive into st more studies, we could see all kinds of people who believe that miracles have happened in their lives. And it seems like there's a very strong basis for believing that miracles do, in fact, happen. And I would ask, as I brought forth those two studies that show the effectiveness of prayer, what better accounts for the data here? Theism or not, although I think anti-theism is what Randolph defined as the belief that there is no God. Um, I would think that theism would explain these studies quite well. If there is a God, it would make sense that prayers are answered. Um, and if there is no God, I don't understand how these two studies happen because there's no effective prayer whatsoever if the person doesn't know it's happening. Yet in these studies, it seems like there is some effectiveness to prayer. Um, Raynoff brings up his other study into the play, um, which showed that, you know, there seemed like there was no effect in this 2006 survey, I believe. Um, and that's fine. Like, I have no problem with accepting that conclusion, but that doesn't change these other studies. God's a free agent. He wouldn't have to act in the same way in every study being done. So I'll kind of leave that at that. Um, in conclusion, uh, this has been a lot of fun. I still think we have three positive arguments for God's existence. I haven't seen why these arguments would fail. Uh, thank you, Randolph. Look forward to your response and looking forward to some fun Q&A. Thank you very much, Zach. I have enjoyed this. And uh, one thing I greatly appreciate is that in this debate, uh, which I think you've done quite well in, um, I've learned that I have some weak areas, which is something that I do come to these debates for. So I consider this to be a successful debate for that. So thank you. Um, our first encounter uh, was you went a lot more easy on me. <laughs> so I can I can see things you've been really studying hard on this stuff. So I uh, congratulate you on that, commend you on that. Um, you're mentioning about uh, how I did not bring up uh, much in the way of anti-theistic claims, and that is because I don't hold the position. So you're right um, in how you uh, quantified uh, what I've said. Um, and the reason I'm neutral on this, which I think is fine, is because I think that uh, an anti-theistic perspective, as well as a theistic perspective, both have opposing claims, opposite claims, the anti-prefix tells, in, in, informs us of that, um, both have um, uh, onus of justifications to, to satisfy, or burdens of proof to satisfy. And so for somebody to prove that a deity exists, and I do have criteria for that, um, but we didn't get into it. Uh, we can do that in the question period if someone wants to do a super chat for that, hint, hint. Um, it's, uh, but it's the anti-theistic perspective to state there absolutely are no deities in the universe or the cosmos um, is also one that carries that onus of justification because uh, in order to prove that, um, an anti-theist would have to uh, demonstrate that every possible place in the universe simultaneously we can't find any deities there and we don't have the tools to do that at this point we can explore our solar system remotely um, we can we've sent people to the moon but we really haven't really been to these other parts of our our universe let alone the cosmos to be able to uh, to to find out and, and we don't even know what the full size of our universe is uh, so we're we're stuck with the with a lot of unknowns here. So that that's kind of why I, I think there there is um, a burden on both sides of the theist and anti-theist side of things. And, and I'm trying to be quite fair in, in stating all this. So I think it's important to do that. And, and you have been, I think. Um, your three reasons that you talked about, um, the argument from contingency, uh, the problem I have with that one is that um, the conclusion for me fails to connect the dots to uh, to your God. And so that's the big leap between that and the other parts of it. Um, I'm not convinced about uh, it being a being and um, a being having omniscient and omnipotent characteristics, uh, which would, I think, require some sort of consciousness. We can get into that later, but um, feel free to shake your head yes or no. <laughs> but um, the, uh, uh, the, the big one for me in that um, argument from contingency is the, the conclusion seems to be introducing the God at this point without the dots being connected. And that for me is missing. So uh, that argument I think fails in that regard. The fine tuning argument uh, being limited uh, only to a small subset of options. Um, and uh, you're asking what are these three options? And that's a fair question. Uh, what are what are the other options? And that's a fair question. 
Um, the problem with that is I'm not, uh, I need to see uh, that there are other universes that we've actually been able to change the constants or at least observe that have different constants so that we can know that that argument actually holds water. It is depending on the variability of these constants, but we don't know if they're actually variable. And that's, that's where that argument falls down, in my opinion. As far as miracles are concerned, we did get into um, uh, the first premise is okay. I'm fine with it because it's conditional and it limits the scope. It's it's more definitional than anything, and so it's fine. Um, it's that second premise that uh, that has problems, I think. And um, ultimately, we did talk about um, uh, about uh, like we talked about the power of prayer. And uh, unfortunately, um, I don't. I didn't know that this topic would be coming up, so I didn't have the foresight to bring with me the kind of studies that would be needed on this. So I certainly would not claim victory on this since I didn't have the information with me. I think it would be unfair for me to do so. Um, I'm going with the most recent study that seems to put it at about a close to a 50-50 uh, mark, and. Um, it, kind of leaves things at, at a neutral point. So I, I, I'm i not really at the point where I'm convinced of this. The big problem that I see with miracles is that they are anecdotal and that, um, and you said you don't subscribe to this, but uh, many Christians that I've talked to do, that a miracle in a sense is a deviation from God's master plan. And that seems to me to defeat his omniscient nature. And that's where I think the, um, the argument for miracles falls down. Thank you very much. I appreciate the mutual respect and uh, really enjoyed this uh, conversation with you. Happy New Year. Well, Jeffy, Jeff, Jeff, what are your final what are your final thoughts? What do you What do you think? I'm looking forward to Q and A, man. Yeah, me me too. But what, how do you? Uh, <clears throat> it's it's up to us. How, how how'd that go? It's up to us. It's up to us. Okay. I yeah, no issues with this debate. I think it was very well. I think it was very well versed. I think we had two people that had very good arguments and very well thought out responses. So it was a nice little parlay. It um yeah there there was uh. The respectful back and forth, I'm, I, you know, at the Atheist Roundtable, we always respect that and we always appreciate that. Um, and uh, I, I love, absolutely love uh, Randolph. And now after hearing Zach um, and, and his uh, preparation and presentation, I have a ton of respect for him. And um, But you know me, Jeff. I, I'm always the one that's like uncomfortably brutally honest. Uh, and I would have to give this one to Zach as far as presentation. Um, and, and again, I don't agree with his God claim, um, but as far as just the, the presentation point by point. Um, so uh, all the all the all the Christians are going to love me um, because I just gave the last two debates to the Christians. <laughs> um, and, and it's not it's not for a lack of preparation on Randolph's part, because uh, um he, he's very, very sharp uh, man. Uh, you, you know, always comes with ready and, and a great argument. Uh, but, but Zach, Zach, point by point was, was uh, I just uh, I felt was more sharp in in this presentation. So, uh, so yes, Christians, you heard it here at the Atheist Roundtable. Two debates in a row, we've given it to the Christians. So quit telling us that we don't love you. <laughs> we we love you. We love you. Uh, but before we bring them back on, because um, we want to get into Q&A, um, if you're not asking your questions in there, um, well, that's your fault. And, and if you don't ask questions, I'm just going to let Jeff ask a bunch of questions. Uh, I have a and, bunch of questions. And that'll be even... I'm in right now, actually. That, that, that'll be... I'm trying, uh, to, I'm trying to keep within the constraints of a $5 super chat. And so I have to rethink how I word this. Okay. All right. So while you're working on that, um, I'm going to bring them on. And uh, I, I know a few uh, questions popped up and there was one early in the show that I screenshot on my phone. Uh, I'll ask that here in a minute um, and, and I'll make sure uh, we get to that because it was a super chat. Uh, but for everybody that's uh, hung out with us tonight, uh, there's been uh, 60 or more on a regular basis hanging out with us and chatting. We appreciate it. Thank you so much uh, for uh, for choosing to hang out uh, here with uh 
Jeff and I, uh, two knuckleheads, and uh, two other uh, two other gentlemen that are m much more intelligent than we are, much more better looking than we are. Um, we we appreciate that. Uh, so we'll we'll get them on screen. We'll we'll dive into the uh, the Q's, the Q's and the A's. I just want to say something real quick. I agree with you, Oz. Um, Zach had an excellent presentation at the opening statement, especially. Uh, definitely more professional than mine. <laughs> well, and, 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 and Randolph, uh, thank you for saying that. And because and, um, I wanted to say it in, in that break, uh, the you know again, Zach, thank you. You know for uh, how you uh, how you came to our channel for the first time, and we we do we 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 value that. We appreciate that. You're welcome back anytime uh, to to have a debate or discussion. Uh, and, and Randolph. Uh, one thing I, I appreciate about Randolph is his humility, um, and he does want to come to each platform, each stage, and learn. And, and man, if 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 you cannot appreciate that, whether you're an atheist or you're a theist, uh, you're in the wrong spot. Well, and that means additional for me. Yeah. <laughs> no, and, and and that's great. And and that's but see, guys, that's that's what this is all about. At the end of the day, like the debates are fun, all that's fun. But it's like if we are all on a pursuit of truth. That's what it's about: is learning and 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 gaining more knowledge, gaining more uh, information. So I, th I think that that's brilliant. I think we all won if 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 you look at it that way, you know. Um, but we'll get to a few uh, questions here. Um, let me scroll up here. Uh, nope, that's not it. Where was it? There it is. Uh, question for Randolph: uh, Can you say we construct possible physical worlds using math? And thereby see uh, see what would happen. I guess they mean S E E. I'm assuming so. Yeah. Uh, we can do it conceptually for sure. Uh, computer modeling is uh, is certainly a part of this, uh, but of course, what often happens is what we do theoretically doesn't always match what we do in reality. So. Um, even though we can do that there, we don't know that that's how things will definitely act in reality. So a, a real world test is is really going to help us out. Hence the term litmus test. Right, right. Um, let's see. How much Q and A are we doing, like time wise? Just. Uh, it, it just depends. Uh, there's there's not uh, there's not a ton there. Um, so what we'll probably do is I'll I'll get through what's here, um, and then maybe. Uh, do like a, uh, a cross examination from uh, maybe Jeff and myself. Just some of the things that we we observe. Maybe ask you guys some questions and then wrap. Um, so, good. Uh, oh, where'd it go? Oh, I already pulled it up. Sorry. <laughs> uh, question for both: If Christ did not resurrect, why no official opposition from the Jewish Sanhedrin? A guy dead for three days and then reappearing alive and well too many would be quite noticeable. Yes? Question mark. I don't know what the Jewish perspective on that would be. Um, I do wonder if uh, uh, if there is truth to that story that uh, what happened during those three days is, seems to be really vague. Uh, I, I don't know if somebody could have just passed out from alcohol and then finally came out of their cave. There's all kinds of different possibilities. Maybe he had a concussion or, or some kind of an injury that put him in a temporary coma. There's all kinds of things that come to mind that I've not been able to rule out. So maybe Zach has some insight on this. <laughs> um, I mean, honestly, I, I'm a lot um, less versed in my theology rather than my philosophy. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, don't, I think especially when we're dealing with like ancient history, absence of evidence is an evidence of absence. Um, but I, I kind of leave it at that for now because it's not. I don't think it's really relevant to the debate topic. Um, but thank you for your question. And that's kind of where I'd leave it. Well, they are asking about the Jewish reaction anyway, and you're a Christian, mm -hmm. so, <laughs> yeah. Yep, and, um, yeah, I have my own opinions about that, but we'll move on. Uh, th this is a super chat from from that, that guy above you on <laughs> uh, uh Zach, you said it was improbable that chance, physical necessity are responsible for the universe. You said it was improbable, not impossible. Is it possible? Yeah, that's a great question. So, yes, I would think it's possible. I think a possibility like is something greater with a with a probability of greater than zero. So, if something has a probability greater than zero, I would say it's possible. So, is it possible that it's due to chance? Well, yeah, of course. I think that that's one of the three um, options I leave out in the premise. Um, 
And then with like physical necessity, is it possible? I think it's possible because I don't see like any inherent contradiction in it. But I think that when we look at like the principle of indifference and things like that, I think there's very good reason to think that physical necessity is not the case. So possible, yes. Probable, I would challenge that. One thing, I, I generally agree, but I, I think that the word I would use differently instead of possible would be not impossible. Because I think possible is veering toward it being a claim that this is something that can actually happen. It's like not probable. impossible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's fine. All right, and then uh, I saw a couple more pop up here. Oh, we got one more from the trolley one. Uh, question for Zach. What would you expect the world to look like if God created the universe and left it to be? That's a great question. Um, so, I mean, I guess you could take this kind of like, that's what deists believe. What would I personally expect? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I expect like, you know, like theistic arguments, like a contingency argument to work. But then things like maybe like, fine tuning or like an argument for miracles. I don't think those would work um, if God created the universe and kind of just left it to be. So I, I think that's kind of what I think, but it's a good question. I have to give it more thought. Um, I would know like, what would your observation be? Like, what would we observe about the universe that would be different from our observation today? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. So like in terms of like, I believe that God does exist and he interacts in the world today and such. Yeah, I think that's really good. Um, I would think that we wouldn't, see as much as people claiming that there is a god um that interacts in terms of like personal experience with like miracles and stuff and i know that's subjective but i think that's an important thing we could lay out i think that studies like i brought earlier in the presentation i don't think those would work um if there wasn't a god that was interacting with the world i don't think it's, i think it'd be studies like the one that were not presented so that's a few things okay and uh, before I get to the other ones that are in the chat right now, before, because I do not want to forget, um, I have this one I screenshot from earlier tonight. Um, it looked like you were making a phone call there. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I would never do that live. Uh, I know you wouldn't. <laughs> um, Zach, uh, for, well, your, your name's in there, this is for you, but uh, I still have, uh, I still have to ask, how much of Christianity uh, is, Zach, is Zach advocating, not just the presence of uh, one God? Right. Um, the presence of, I mean, like I'm a Christian, I'd affirm like basic creeds, like, you know, like you have like the death and res resurrection of Christ, the Trinity, things like that. Like I would affirm all that in terms of Christian, the one God thing. I don't know if you're referring to the Trinity. Like I'm obviously not a polytheist. I believe there's one God that's the necessary foundation, but I do think obviously God exists as a Trinity in three persons. And I think that can be, it's a good challenge to like the um, from four to five in my contingency argument, but I think ultimately Trinity's result of perfection. I don't think there's any arbitrary limits to the Trinity, if that's what kind of you're inferring to. Um, but I mean, it seems like an interesting question, so I hope that helps. Yeah, and I, th I think, uh, and I haven't seen that person in the in the chat here for uh, a few minutes, but I, I think what what was being asked was, um, are are you um, are are you arguing for the Christian or Bible God, or could mm. you just, or could you just um, plant any God into that argument? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think with um, the contingency argument, you, you could plant any like monotheistic God. Like, I think you could get the God of Islam or the God of Judaism. I think you could also get a deistic God or kind of like an Aristotelian God. Um, so I think there's like different versions of like general monotheism that you could get with a contingency argument fine tuning, I think kind of the same, but I think you'd have to think that there'd have to be um, a God that cared about like maybe like embodied moral agents. And then I think with the prayer argument or the miracles argument, I think that you get to a God that cares about this world and is interacting in the world. Um, so it just depends on the argument. Just to clarify that deity would have to have characteristics of omnipotence and omniscience. Is that correct? Um, yes. I mean, okay. I think it helped to flesh the, out what those mean. But yeah, I think that God's omnipotent and omniscient. And I think all those models of God would agree. So, I mean, there's open theists who are Christians and would say something challenging omniscience, but I don't think that's really relevant. So, yeah. Right. And, and, and always remember to flush. Always remember to flush. That's that's important. Um, yeah. <laughs> a question for both. What's your guys' favorite color? Blue or you're wrong. I'm wow. wrong. <laughs> it's red right now. <laughs> I change my favorite from time to time. <laughs> Jeff, what's your favorite color? Um, green, dark green, or uh, dark blue. 
Me it's too. Me too. My yes, sir. Me too. Me too. <laughs> Oh, that was weird. And uh, believe it or not, pink. I like pink a lot too. All right, I, I was told at a young age that boys aren't allowed to like pink, so I had to abandon that. Weird. Uh, you didn't have free will. I didn't. I was told you can't like that color. Oh, what a terrible childhood. No. Oh, where'd it go? You're free now, though. Yes. And, when are you uh, Witter, uh, Witter Chins, Yeah, if you if you super chatted, um. <laughs> I'm not seeing it, and usually I see those. I, I keep my eye out because I always try to give, make sure I give those loves. Period. Uh, but if, if if you did, just re-ask your question. Don't super chat again. Just re-ask your question. I'll make sure. Or super chat again. Uh, or super chat again if yeah. if you really love us. Maybe if you need to double the amount to really, see it longer. If you really love us, and if if you do it for like a hundred dollars, I'll ask it like three times. Yeah. Um, but here we go. Uh, <clears throat> question for Zach. What is your response to people saying your resource wasn't double blind, but was actually a placebo? Um, I was just looking it up. Like, I mean, I think it's like in respected peer reviewed journals. Um, so like I can like copy and paste the citations from my slide and put them in my private chat in the private chat. And you guys can like put it in the public chat. If you like, in if you think they're double blind, just read the studies for yourself and come to the conclusion. Cause I'm just literally like in those slides, I literally just basically took quotes from the articles. I mean, I appreciate the question, but I think just look it up for yourself and you can kind of see that they're double blind. So, yeah. Okay. Do you think that, do you think that there's a better example? Like that's one example. Do you have something that maybe is even more clear of an example of a miracle? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think that, I think personal experience can be useful in arguments for miracles. I think it's kind of, it can get tricky because there's a lot of things where it could have just easily fit under a naturalistic explanation. But I think someone's own personal experience, there's things where we could point to where it seems either very improbable or impossible that it would occur under the belief that God does not exist. Um, I think that there's other studies, Craig Keener did a lot of work on this, but I mean, just for the sake of the debate, I just brought two examples from like peer reviewed studies. I was hoping like, even if you disagree with the conclusions, you'd accept that like, these are like like these studies happen and they're like completely honest like you can disagree with like that prayer was a part of it but you can agree like that there's no dishonesty in the study so i figured that for like a debate um this was the best because i think that the studies the the results would be accepted even if you're a skeptic because it's like in peer-reviewed medical journals and such um so yeah zach, zach you're a christian everything you say is dishonest <laughs> well, well, dude, you're right. I need to go home now. I'm sorry. I need to go home. Oz is looking for the next uh, Oz question. Oh. Well, Oz is looking for the next next question. The uh, the other question I had for you is: Why do you think that if God does exist and do miracles, why is it that He does these miracles in such a way that we just can't prove it and it's not clear? Yeah. Like it's almost yeah. the same as chance when it comes to a miracle. Yeah. It, it doesn't seem like there's a clear distinction between the two. Yeah, 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 that's great. I love that question. Um, or in, in some cases, it seems like he's removed the evidence almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love this. Um, there's a few, there's a lot of things we could unpack here. Um, I would disagree that it seems like it's like that it's always absent. Like it's just, a lot of this is going to relate to like divine hiddenness. Um, like if God mm -hmm. is real, if God's personal, if He cares about us, why does He seem so hidden? Um, that's a great question. And I well, I first contest the idea that these results aren't obvious. Like I think that. You know, we can look at like these peer reviewed studies and it seems like something is happening here. I would contest um, if we look at like studies from around the world to the vast majority of people, the existence of God is something that is plainly obvious. Like um, if you look at the world, like 99 percent of the world is theist. And um, a lot, I think there's a study done by Pew and they did like 10 or 12 different countries and like 10 or 15 percent of all these people um believe that there was like a personal god that had done like miracles in their lives so i would contest the idea that like well while god may seem hidden to some people to other people he seems very obvious so i think if we're going to just go off personal experience i think we're going to kind of have to cancel those two things out um so then we get to like the intellectual problem of like jl schellenberg laid out a hiddenness argument where he's like um there's a contradiction between like an all-loving god um and him like seeming hidden and there being like non-resistant non-believers there's so much that could be said here and i'd say that um god seems hidden in part that we can have free will i think that if god made his existence obvious in a way that we could not deny it i think that we would have no free will because we have to choose him and i think the whole point of having free will is to develop a relationship 
um, to, to choose him. Um, so there's a lot that could be unpacked here. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of like my basic answer. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually, uh, um, from the Christian perspective, that's a good short answer. Usually that's not a very short answer. <laughs> uh, Was he dishonest? <laughs> Um, completely, completely. <laughs> <dumb>. uh, <laughs> <laughs> completely dishonest. Uh, so that's a um, good question, Zach. <laughs> we, 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 we we finally have some questions flown in here, so let's 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 have some fun. So I will uh, have to slide out in about like 10, 15 minutes, just so you guys know. All um, right. So yeah. so then it's, it's up to you I to practice. Brevity. Yeah. It's it's Zach. It's up to you to practice brevity. Then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Question: uh, What's the difference between a miracle and unexplainable phenomenon? Non-non. Great question, atheist Chico. Um, I don't know if you saw my opening statement, but in the slide where it says miracles happen, I define a miracle as an event that would not occur if metaphysical naturalism is true. Um, so that's how I define a miracle: as some, an event that would not occur if metaphysical naturalism is true. I remember you saying that <laughs> in your opening statement. <laughs> Boom! There. There we go. Oh man, I, mean, I, I thought I saw a bunch more pop in, and I got all excited. Hold on. Um, nope, no, those popped in. My bad. Um, I thought I saw a question about favorite colors. We answered. Yeah, I, I asked that. Oh no, no, it was another one uh, relating to it. So. Oh, what, what did it say? Something about uh, God. Um, oh, from Captain Deadpool at six fifty nine p.m. It says. Did God predetermine our favorite color for us? <laughs> well, it's like, it sounds like a Calvinist argument. And I, my response would be, not that I know of. <laughs> oh, here, here, here we go. And and I, since we don't have any other questions, and I know this isn't on the philosophy part, uh, it's more theology. Uh, but since we don't have any other questions, we'll go ahead and do it because I enjoy this conversation. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be completely selfish right now. Uh, question, explain, it's not really... I guess it's a request, not a question. Explain the crucifixion. Is that story a good or a bad story, and why? I have an answer, but let Zach go first. I was about to say, Zach, you're you're, you're the uh, you're the Christian. So, what's how would you answer that? Right. Well, I'm, I'm assuming this is referring to the crucifixion of Christ, not just like any old crucifixion. Right. right um, yeah. I mean, I think the story of God taking on the flesh um, for us is a beautiful story. Um, I'll keep it brief because I don't want to get to it. I think it's beautiful. And I mean, you could say like maybe penal substitution, substitutionary atonement's unethical or something like that. And like, if that's your personal belief, that's fine. But you don't have to believe in PSA to be a Christian or to think the Christian God exists. I mean, if it's true, it's true, but that's not necess a necessary component of Christianity. So I think God taking on the flesh, um, experiencing the evils that we do, I think that's a beautiful story. Um, and you can kind of draw the theological conclusions from that that you may, but I think God's perfect. And I think, yeah. I think uh, it's a bad story, and the reason is because I think vicarious redemption is unethical. Um, he's dying for other people's sins, and um, that I have a serious problem with. That is not conducive to a proper justice system, in my view. Cool. And I, I want to pull this up real quick. Uh, oh, where to go? Where to go? Man, these things move so fast, it's hard to keep up with them. So I'm just, don't mind the actual uh, comment here, but uh, Cooper Gates, uh, you had tagged me in something and asked a question. I'm not sure uh, what you're referring to. So if you give me a little clarity, I'll, I, I would love to help. I'll attempt to answer. I did change my shirt today. Oh, that's great. That, that's awesome. Thanks, Randall. He's asking about change. <laughs> so, so everybody, uh, all 60 people watching, uh, Randolph changed his shirt today. So there you go. They asked. I don't know. <laughs> Randolph, Randolph wins. Game over. <laughs> Question. Uh, is faith required to be a theist? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, well, one, it's going to depend on what you define as faith. I think a faith is just um, believing what you don't know with certainty um, or with like 100% certainty, which is just about everything, um, at least from my perspective because of like Beijing stuff. Um, so that's fun. Um, so yeah, I think faith is required to be a theist. And I think that, yeah, I mean, you, we don't have a hundred percent, like absolute certainty, like two plus two equals four, or that like the law of identity of law of non-contradiction that God exists. I think that there's a very high, I make it very high, but I don't think it's like absolutely like laws of logic certain. Um, 
So yeah, but I also think that I know Randolph defines atheism as just an absence of belief, but I think if you're going to follow the negation on the belief that God does not exist, I think that would take faith in a sense too, at least the way I define it, because I don't think you can know for certainty um, that there's maybe these brute facts or something like that. So I think it goes both ways. It's not. I think Zach had a really good argument for theism without appealing to faith during the debate. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was about to say, I, I was like, man, like I was really digging Zach's argument. And then, and then he said, yeah, faith is required. And I was, <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> if we're going to follow the alternative to theism, not non-theism, atheism, whatever you define it all the way through, I think you're going to have to have a similar view of what I see as faith too. So I think either way, you're so, not going to get absolutely 100% Cartesian certainty. Um, so, whatever right. you know. so if I can, uh, Zach, just real yeah. quick. Um, and sorry for over talking to you. I didn't mean to do that. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I'm not Darth Dawkins. You. Um, uh, what, I'm not pre What? What? What is? How, how do you define faith? And, and maybe that'll help us. No. Yeah, that's a great question. Nishin. Great um, question. I don't have like a working definition of faith that I always go to. I just kind of think of faith as something that I believe that I don't have um, absolute Cartesian certainty about. Um, so like I have faith that God exists and that Jesus rose from the dead. I don't like know with certainty. I think there's really good reasons to believe it, but I don't have certainty about it. Um, so like faith is kind of like, well, I, I see these reasons and these evidences. So I follow it through like the same reason I'd have faith that like, maybe like my parents love me. Like I have a very high degree of probability that my parents love me, but I don't have certainty of it. I just have faith based off kind of like the data and evidence I've been given. Um, so that's kind of like a working thing, but I don't have like an absolute definition of faith. Okay. And, and um, if if you'd want to, Zach, I would actually love to invite you on a regular TARP live show to mm -hmm. talk about that. that that's that's our, uh, that's kind of our, um, our favorite thing to talk about is, is faith and how do you justify what you believe in? You know, um, sure. so if you're willing to do that, I would love to do that. And I know philosophy is, you know, uh, your, your wheelhouse. Uh, mm -hmm. But I do believe that all of us should always be trying to identify, you know, um, the the way or the, the the matter in which we justify our beliefs. Um, mm -hmm. So I'd love to have you on just have that conversation. Nothing more, yeah. nothing less. Um, and you're going to get the same um, serious, but you're going to get the same uh, semantics. Uh, we, we still love to have fun. Um, so it'll be entertaining and serious conversations at the same time. But if Randall, I get to listen to your voice, Oz, I'm in. Okay. <laughs> you have a cool voice. I like your voice. So yeah. you have chosen wisely. <laughs> um, yeah, I just uh, address to look, first talk about faith and then uh, talk about uh, address one point uh, Zach made uh, about faith. My understanding is, uh, and I, I agree with Zach's idea of faith. I think that makes sense. Uh, it's a very reasonable way to define it, and it's. Um, what I've noticed in talking with Christians over the years, when I ask Christians, what is a requirement to be a Christian? Um, the, there very often are different reasons, but one reason it's always, always there is a belief in God, a faith that there is a God. So um, I think um, I'd be interested to know, Zach, if you disagree with that, I, I think you probably agree. Wait, can you repeat that? So in talking with different Christians over the years, the one common thing that uh, seems to be with all Christians is a belief in God. Mm -hmm. That seems yeah, to be. I mean, I think you, to be a Christian, you'd have to believe in God because Christianity yeah. hangs on the resurrection and there's no resurrection without God existing. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, and that, that's, and that's what I'm finding with you as well. So it's quite consistent. When you mentioned about how I define atheism, that personalizes it to me, but I can't take credit for that. That is standard way it's defined that's all i wanted to say on that one push back okay. on i mean i don't really care enough to debate the definition of atheism and if that's how you define it i'm i have no problem with that, that's I'm not how it's that in like a rude way but yeah that's fine i right, just clarifying it's not me defining it that's how it's defined that's all yeah cool all right so we got one more question and I'm sorry, I saw now several other ones are actually popping up now that I say that. Um, and, and I apologize, but um, uh, some, some of the folks have some things they got to get, get. You should have got it in earlier. They should, you had all this time. <laughs> yeah. it in. You wait till now. I got a stack of like 18 zillion books over there that I need to read. So, you know. Yeah. So I, I'm, I guess I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. Is that the saying? Uh, but, but one last one here. 
Uh, Super Chat, Nathaniel Robinson, thank you for $5. Can God do logically impossible? Big Rock, 100% man, 100% God, ungod himself in human form, not know when he will return, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, this is a great question. Um, I remember Randolph bringing these up in the first debate that we had a long time ago, like a year and a half ago. And I was oh, like, yeah, there's, a, there, there's an answer to this. I just don't remember what it was. Um, but yeah, this is a great question. This is like what's called part of the omnipotence paradox. Um, there's like, can God create a rock so heavy that he can't lift it? Um, all kinds of things like that. And I think it's helpful to remember, like, what is my definition of God in the beginning? I define God as maximally great. Um, God can do all possible things. God can't create a married bachelor because that is self-contradictory and um yeah i think that's good there's a quote from isaac asimov that i had pulled up because i didn't know if this was gonna come up in the debate but it says that a universe in which there exists such a thing at as an irresistible force is by definition a universe which cannot contain an immovable object and a universe which contains an immovable object cannot by definition also contain an irresistible force so the question is essentially meaningless either the force is irresistible or the object is immovable but not both um it's just like responding to can god create a rock so heavy he can't lift it so god is maximally great he can do all possible things so there's no if you want to call the laws of logic restriction, you can, but God's not limited in any way. He can do all possible things. He's maximally great. There's no conceivable being greater than God. Um, so that's kind of how I respond to that. So I think yeah, I remember back. that that was on modern day debate, and I, I do remember mentioning that that's a kind of argument I don't like to bring up because I find it meaningless as well. Mm -hmm. Which which part of it, Randolph? Sorry, the argument that he brought up uh, uh, that we had discussed briefly in modern day debate. Long time ago. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. The only problem I see with it is that if, if he's maximally great and he can do anything, then that means any option that he made when reading a holy text, regardless of the holy text means that he chose that option amongst infinite other options. Therefore it should be the best option. And when you see things like a biblical flood, meaning I had to do it this way, when we can think of a thousand other ways to do it that are better or being able to complete a goal without interfering with free will, even though he interferes with free will all the time. So those are the only problems I have with the maximally great um, argument is like, well, then why would you do this? You know, and then it just it goes down a rabbit hole of like, well, this is the reason because of this excuse and blah, 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 blah. Uh, that's the only problem I have with that one. Right. Um, can I respond to that just very briefly before we wrap things up here? I was no. be very, I'd be very, no. very a great no, we're good in conversation. <laughs> fight him, Zach. <laughs> fight him. <laughs> Jeff, would be, Jeff would beat me up. He's more followers than me on TikTok. Um, oh, Jeff. Okay. Okay. Just very, I would say conceivability isn't a very good guide to possibility. Um, that's kind of like the first thing I'd bring up. Um, why this world? I mean, it depends on how you're going to, a lot of it depends on how you're going to interpret these texts. Like if you're good, like I don't interpret in terms in terms of a worldwide flood. Um, I think God's. You could say Jesus, like the option that, of Jesus sending Jesus to atone for the sins that we originally got. Those mm -hmm. though that would be an option too that I don't see necessity for. Like it could have been completed a different way. Yeah, maybe, but I mean, I, I I'm just trying to go off of the evidence that we'd be given. Could have got. Yeah, I mean, I, it's possible that God could have created things differently, but I don't see why that would kind of lead to without a different sacrifice, without hate, without death, without torture. You well, know, there there'd be a solution without free will. I mean, without in, interfering with free will. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sympathetic to a, a skeptical theistic position a little bit. I think, like with like the problem of evil and such, I think we can look at like good theodicies, like a free will defense or understanding like divine hiddenness. Um, but I also think there's just a point where we're just not going to be able to understand everything. Um, but I do think that, like, given the data that we have, there's good reasons to accept God's existence and Christianity and such. And maybe there's different ways it could have gone that we may think of as better. But maybe in, like, the grand scheme of things, they're actually not that much better than we think they would be. Um, and I think it's also helpful in terms of, like, understanding, like, theories of the atonement or the flood. Like, don't get caught up in one specific theory because there's just so many different ideas about how all these things are put together. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Cool. Well, um, we'll wrap up here, guys. And, and uh, be, before we do, I want to give. Um, sorry, I feel like something that's like bit me in the back. Damn. Yeah, fleas. Um, you got rid of those fleas, though. We we're talking about that earlier. You got that ointment the doctors gave you. Oh, all the. All the oh, I'm sorry. We were talking about that earlier. That was something else. Um, yeah. Thanks, Jeff, for that asshole. Um, 
but we'll uh, we'll wrap up here and uh, appreciate everybody that's been uh, with us. It's been like sixty and uh, over almost the entire uh, the entire debate. So we appreciate that. Uh, and one last time, guys, uh, plug and chill away. Uh, anytime we have guests on the debate, we want to make sure you guys get your exposure, not just here, but then uh, for people to follow, uh, subscribe, follow, friend you, all that fun stuff. So uh, Randolph, we'll let you kick it off first this time. Tell everybody where they can find you. First, just briefly, I'll say I really appreciate the debate tonight. I, I think Zach presented arguments better than I presented them, and uh, I learned a lot. Um, so thank you for that, Zach, for bringing your A game. It was excellent. Um, you can reach me at uh, uh, on Twitter at uh, twitter.com slash Randolph828. That's Randolph spelled with an F. Uh, you can also find me at uh, Canadian Atheist, www.canadianatheist.ca. I have a YouTube channel. Is uh, youtube.com slash Randolph Richardson. Remember the word Randolph is spelled with an F. I'm also going to be starting a call-in program, an atheism call-in program with Neil, the 604 Atheist, will be equal co-hosts. And the website for that is www.truenorthtalk.ca, which also has a link to the YouTube channel. So thank you very much for uh, having us on here, uh, Tart, Oz, and Jeff, and everybody else. Uh, Mike, thanks. Absolutely. Great to Absolutely. see you again, Zach. It was a pleasure. And uh, and I'm excited for that call-in show, by the way. Oh, thank, thank you. Great. Uh, and shout out to uh, Neil, the 604 Atheist, real quick. Uh, we have three of our, uh, uh, part of our, uh, uh, the TARP community that are going to be on his show here in the next three weeks um, coming up, uh, sharing their uh, deconstruction and deconversion stories. So shout out to uh, to Neil and his uh, fake long hair. Uh, Zach, where <laughs> Zach, where does everybody find you? For that. Uh, thank you again, um, Oz and Jeff, for hosting right off debating. It's been a lot of fun. Um, you can find me at Adherent Apologetics. There's a link down below to the YouTube channel. Maybe someone can put it in the chat. That's great. Um, and Adherent Apologetics is just like a, a show where I interview um, philosophers or theologians, all kinds of stuff. I'm actually talking with a theologian on Monday about dark passages in the Bible and like things like the flood and the atonement and stuff like that. Like, why would God have this happen? Um, we just talk about with all kinds of different things. Like next week, we're talking about dark, pack, pack, dark passages in the Bible to mystic teleological arguments, medieval Christian mis mysticism and a debate on God's existence. Um, so all kinds of fun stuff added here in Apologetics. You can subscribe to us on YouTube or on a podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. If you can do that on your way out, that'd be appreciated. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Awesome, Zach. And uh, um, I know, Zach, you said uh, something about where, where somebody's from. I'm from <laughs> central Pennsylvania. Um, I saw that. So like okay. State College, Penn State area. So, yeah. from, the, from the PA. From the PA. All right, so, so I'm just going to dox everybody on screen. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Tough. Uh, but no, uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being a part of the, of the debate tonight. Great conversation. And uh, again, Zach, thank you for being prepared. And, and uh, you came in like a boss tonight. Uh, you know, and, and Rand Randolph was a boss in his own right. Zach, you. you yeah, don't you, disrespect you, Randolph. He's a pretty smart guy with a nice Canadian accent and a good mustache and a lot of intelligence. So. I, I was just going to say, I, I, I respect Randolph. Uh, I respect the hell of that man and, and his humility and the way he approaches uh, these discussions. Uh, but, you know, it, it is what it is. And we're uh, the Atheist Roundtable. We always want to make sure. When people come on, we're going to call it down the middle. We're going to be fair, even even as atheists. If it hurts us to say it, <laughs> we're going to say if the better argumentation was presented by the theists, we're going to say that. Um, and, Let's and say it doesn't hurt. Yeah, <laughs> and, and no, and, and Randolph has told me that well, uh, even in, in private chat. Like if, if if there's something that you see that be can be critiqued to be better, I want to know it. Um, so I can I, I know I can do that. Be comfortable doing that because he wants to get better, and I love that. I wish I wish more people had that approach. It was like, no, I want to get if if it's a defeat, if it's an L, I'll take the L if it means I get to get better. You know, um, so I, I love that. So, uh, Jeff, anything before we go from you, man? Nope. Nope. And Je Jeff has his own uh, uh, pre-recorded show coming up in case you missed that earlier. Tons of great shit coming. But uh, we're going right. to be talking in our first episode about Ron Watt. Ooh. Ooh. And all of his claims. Jesus' blood, nails, Ark of the Covenant. They found Noah's Ark. All that stuff. Isn't yeah. Noah's Ark in Kentucky? Not that one. <laughs> Not the one that leaks. <laughs> With dinosaurs on it. Well, that one's paid for by taxpayers. Yeah. It's, yeah. 
<laughs> anyway, everybody in the chat that's hung out with us, thank you. This is the Atheist Roundtable Debate Night, and we're out. Welcome to Let's Get It The Atheist Roundtable. That was terrible. Let's do that again. Uh, how's the mic? What you doing? What up with Eddie? Why he sweaty on your noodle? I don't get it. He lost his shit. The whole kid caboodle. Now pause. You owes. Everybody tell him that he's a lost cause. Who's the ass in the hat? Half Christian ass. Always talking this and talking that. And Benji, Benji on the epistemology. You got claims, got beliefs. What's your confidence? And is it relevant? Nah. Just Jeff. What's next? What text you gonna put to the test? Cut to the test, little troll face weasel on TikTok, looking like a beetle juice. And what do you do when a member of your crew sits in a shed with the dead? I don't know what's up. Anybody seen me jump? Uh, now the newest member of the crew, the talk debut. Here's your preview. It's K Nabs. She says she's the live stream queen. Welcome to the team. Uh, yeah, yeah. Welcome to the team. The atheist round table. Is faith a reliable pathway to truth? Hey, yo, Oz, are we going on a deep dive? Faith is bullshit. Jesus in the morning.